This story takes place in the summer of 2003. Me, male and 17, and my friend, female and 16, were hanging out at her house together. We fell upon talking about a subject that was passionate for both of us, her backs. As we were talking about this, she told me there was actually an abandoned factory just 30 minutes away from her house. Two seconds is all it took for us to grab our backpack full of cigarettes, food, and water, and then start walking over. Of course, we took five-minute breaks from time to time and continued steadily on our path. Eventually, we arrived. We were absolutely in love with the creepiness and the absence of life in this place. Let me introduce you to the four buildings. It will help you understand the rest of the story. The first building was a locked building. Not much more information on it, probably just somewhere they stocked wood and metal. The second building, the big factory, was obviously the biggest building of the four. There were three floors, a basement, a working space, and an eating place on the highest floor. The third building, a structure made of wood, contained various machines. And finally, there was the fourth building, a small gas station, where there were keys to the other rooms. There was a second floor as well, but we didn't go on to the second one, for a reason you'll see soon. Okay, so we entered the big factory, the second building. At first, we were really getting shivers, but as time passed by, we got more and more comfortable with the ambience of the place we were in. I'm not gonna lie, the alcohol also helped with that a bit. Then came the moment, though. We had to do it. We were so curious. We stood in front of the door and opened it, and there we were, the basement. As we advanced into this room, we arrived to a small office. We noted there was a cup with fresh coffee in it, we didn't think much of it at first. Maybe people like us had recently come here, or perhaps there was a squatter or something. We didn't have time to make any more theories, though, when we heard something from right behind us. It was a clown's horn. We looked at each other and laughed nervously. We thought that one of us must have stepped on a toy or something. But again, from right behind us, a clown horn sounded once more. We heard footsteps and someone's cynical, maniacal laugh right behind us. Needless to say, we took off running for the door and left outside as fast as we could. We stood there outside, scared. At this point, we didn't even believe that really just happened. We laughed it off as our mind playing tricks on us and took another sip of our beers. After a moment to recollect ourselves, we went back in. Yeah, a stupid idea, I know. But don't worry, we didn't even stay there another five minutes. As we looked towards the basement door, we saw a hand opening it from the other side. That was it. We ran back home. I never ran so fast in my entire life. I think there's a small detail that will make you understand how bad it could have really been, though. One hour later, as we were going to a restaurant to eat for the night, we heard gunshots ring out from the exact direction of where the factory was. That night, we didn't get much sleep at all, and to this day, I never went back to that area. What would you do if you were alone in a dark place? Not even a strange place, even someplace familiar to you like your own basement or garage and you happen to see two points of light glinting at you from across the room. Would your fight-or-flight instinct immediately kick in, or would you freeze, unable to move from the shock and terror weighing down on you? Back in 2010, I had this experience firsthand, though unfortunately not in a place that was familiar to me. At the time, I didn't know if I would ever see the daylight again. I live in Auckland, New Zealand, which is located on the Northern Island. I have a degenerative bone disease that weakens me and makes me even more frail with every passing year. At the time, I had just recently been diagnosed, and I decided to try and live my life to the fullest while I still could. I had a friend named Jacoby, 
he was a big-time conspiracy nut. He didn't have a cell phone or a bank account, and made money here and there by showcasing his sidewalk chalk art. I asked him what he would do if his days were numbered. He said that he would find a spot untouched by man and mark his name on a rock or a tree. I decided to take his advice and do some exploration in the Northland. I didn't just want to visit any tourist trap cave though. I wanted to visit a cave most people didn't know about. Jacoby and I did some research and made contact with a few hardcore outdoors type guys. We discovered that there was in fact such a small cave that very few people knew about. It was incredibly difficult to get to. We met up with a couple of guys named Ben and Angus who knew where the cave was. We put together a group of six people to go exploring. I knew the idea of a guy with brittle bone disease going exploring in caves didn't really sound like a brilliant idea. I had at least four different people pointing that out to me. I just badly wanted to experience that as soon as possible though, before I grew too weak to even climb a staircase by myself. They warned us there was going to be a very small chance of rescue in case of emergency, and that we would be all on our own. I said my goodbyes to my immediate family, and started the trip at dawn. By 10am we reached the spot where we would have to leave our car and by midday we were deep in the heart of the New Zealand wilderness. Angus forged the path ahead with a machete. I followed immediately after, with Jacoby and my other friend Elijah carrying the tents, water, and first aid. Ben and another guy named Mark led the back. All things considered, I was feeling pretty good, despite my condition. I was able to keep pace with the others well enough. As the day wore on, every once in a while we would pass a tree with a weird symbol carved into it, and Jacoby would go on and on about how some alien race had probably landed back there in World War II after the Nazis failed to colonize Antarctica. I just rolled my eyes. That was the kind of conspiracy theory noise he was always going on about. We all let him keep talking though, because he provided us with some unintended laughs. By nightfall, we were nearly at the cave, so we set up camp and built a fire. Then Ben used a flashlight to lead us to the cave's entrance. We cracked some celebratory beers as we shone the lights deep into the depths of the cave. The floor slanted downwards at a nearly 60 degree angle. We had just finished our drinks and cigars and were all about to head back to the camp for the night. That was when we all heard something echoing deep down within the cave. It sounded like a rock had shifted and rolled around. Nothing too exciting. The faint noise was enough to get Jacoby going on a tangent though about how draconians must be nearby and they were hidden with their invisible cloaking devices. You know, like in the Predator. We must all be in their crosshairs right now. Ben then screamed into the night that Jacoby was our leader and his head was the one they wanted. That got us all having a good laugh. We headed back to camp, but as I turned to follow the others up the path, I glanced down into the darkness of that cave. For just a split second, I could see a pair of eyes looking up at me, reflecting the light from the night sky before disappearing into the darkness of the cave once more. A chill passed over me, but I immediately shook it off. I convinced myself I was just seeing things. In fact, I didn't even tell the others about it, which might not have been such a good idea. The following morning, we anchored two lines at the mouth of the cave and steadily made our way down, holding onto the ropes for support. Once at the bottom, there was a small cavern with two massive rocks that were pinned against each other. We had to crawl underneath in order to continue deeper into the cave. We each had flashlights, water, and were tied to another person. This was so no one could get lost. Mark and I were attached to each other's belts by a cord, and together we made our way in front of the others and deeper into this dark and rocky void. I'm not sure how many of you have been deep underground, but it's a thrilling yet terrifying experience. You could almost feel the weight of the very earth itself crushing down upon you from above. 
The air was extremely stale and dusty, and absolutely everything echoed around us. We got used to keeping our voices low as we spoke because of this. All in all, we were underground for a good several hours, pausing every so often to take a breather. For the most part, we continued to push onward, though, down the twisting, winding cavern. We reached a small section of the cave where it was too narrow to go any further, as the crack in the wall was just barely enough to fit me moving sideways. I took out a spray can and marked my initials upon a rock, then began the rough uphill climb with Mark back to the others. We had been out front the entire time, and we were heading back from what we had assumed to be a dead end. You can imagine our surprise then, when from the dark behind us came the sudden sound of what sounded like short and sharp breaths. Mark and I both heard it. We turned back around, shining our lights back down the way we had come from, but we couldn't see anything at the moment. Mark made a comment that it had to be the sound of air moving through a crack in the wall. We kept moving. After two minutes or so, I paused though. Positive, I just heard that sound again. Only, that didn't make sense. If it really was just air coming through a crack, we would have been well out of earshot by now. I glanced behind me again and nearly gasped out loud. This is going to sound incredibly cliche, but I saw them again. Those pale eyes, staring back at me from the darkness. In that moment, I thought of screaming and telling Mark to run, but I forced myself to keep a straight face as I turned back around and continued climbing. I thought about that thing of dogs being able to tell when humans are afraid and attacking if they ran away. In my mind, whatever this was behind me was keeping its distance for now, hesitant to get too close. If we started to run though, who knows what might happen. The thing might feel emboldened and start to chase us. For the next half hour or so, Mark and I made our way back through the cave, with me glancing over my shoulder every five minutes. I did not see the eyes again though. When we met up with Ben and Elijah, I didn't want to say anything about the eyes. I was terrified that if I said anything, they might have wanted to retrace our steps and get a closer look. We made our way back to the mouth of the cave much more slowly than I would have liked. After another half hour or so of carefully watching our footing, we emerged from the cave's mouth and back out into the daylight. It nearly blinded me. It took another 40 minutes before Angus and Jacoby clambered out as well. During that entire time, I was having a nervous breakdown convinced that whatever this unseen thing was must have grabbed them in the dark. It turns out Angus had taken a fall and scraped up his leg, and they'd had to move slowly to get back out. Even after we returned to camp, started a fire, and cooked dinner, I kept my mouth shut. Everyone else was in a really good mood, having a lot of fun. I didn't want to cause concern or suspicion by bringing up those eyes. Now that I was back out in daylight, I was starting to convince myself I had never seen anything at all. That night, I had some trouble sleeping. I tossed and turned in my tent for so long, I actually caused the tent to detach from its lining and collapse in on itself. I cursed and struggled in the dark to find the zipper and free myself. When I finally poked my head out of the tangle of cloth, though, I froze, right at the edge of our campsite, staring directly at me were those eyes, closer than they'd ever been before. I felt around in the dark until I found my flashlight, and without breaking eye contact, I turned it on, keeping my hand pressed over the light. The eyes were still there, unmoving and unblinking. In that moment, I had my chance to shine the light directly on whatever this was, but I couldn't bring myself to do so. After a minute, the eyes disappeared. I heard a rustling in the undergrowth moving away. I stayed dead still for what seemed like a small eternity and eventually passed out from exhaustion. The next morning, Jacoby woke me up and pointed out some fresh marks on a tree right at the edge of the campsite where I had seen the eyes last night. Three vertical cuts, the fourth one horizontal and underneath those. Jacoby was convinced the Draconians must have visited us during the night. 
but when I made eye contact with Ben, he looked disturbed. From the look in his eyes, I got a sense he'd seen whatever I had seen the night before, too. We packed up and left. We all made it back safely. I can't really describe why I didn't point the light at the eyes in that moment. I guess a part of me was terrified I would discover some monster or something. I suppose it could have been nothing, or something that was laughably obvious and unthreatening, but I don't think so. I believe more than anything that something was obviously there. I haven't been exploring since. I still live in New Zealand, but my condition has gotten much worse. I'm now bound to a wheelchair. Regardless of that scare though, I'm glad I took the trip. I still talk to Jacoby every now and then, and even though I would never admit it, Sometimes I wonder if maybe some of those far-out conspiracy theories aren't as crazy as I once thought they were. I was at home during the week. It was just me and my child. He was two at the time. As we were relaxing together, suddenly somebody knocked at the door. I went to answer it and see who it was. At the door, there were two kids. One was a girl around five years old, and the other was a boy that looked to be around nine or so. It's a small town, so I knew the faces of pretty much everyone in the area, but I didn't recognize these two kids at all. The girl asked me if I could help them, because the both of them were lost. Obviously, I tried to help. They were about to walk in after I allowed them, but stopped when they saw my son. They immediately walked back out of my living room. The youngest one simply said, Never mind, we have to go. Just as suddenly as they'd come, they both took off running. I turned around, picked up my son, and walked outside, but I couldn't find them anywhere. It's like they'd just vanished altogether. That was so weird. I live right in the middle of my street, so I'm pretty sure two small kids couldn't have gotten out of sight that quickly. I have no idea what that was all about, or what the hell happened to them, but it was certainly very creepy. To the best of my memory, it was the late 80s, on a hot and sunny day in Toronto, Canada. I was about 12 years old. My friends and I were playing baseball at a public school baseball diamond, which was on a relatively busy street. Just for reference, this school has since been demolished, and a new school building was built right over said baseball diamond. A new building with the exact same name. Also, interesting random fact, the old school building happens to be the location where country singer Michelle Wright did her music video for All I Really Wanna Do. Now, back to the story. A man in his 40s walked up and sat on the bench right beside the baseball diamond, right underneath the hot sun. No hat, nor any other kind of shade. We thought this was a little bit odd, but we kept playing anyway. He was watching us and would shout some comments pertaining to baseball here and there. I suppose he was quite bored and had nothing better to do. Let's call him man number one. The baseball diamond was right beside the busy street, which had its share of poor people, middle class people, drug addicts, drug dealers, prostitutes, and other weirdos. Needless to say, we were pretty used to random stuff going on around us. As the man kept shouting though, his uninvited baseball comments began to really annoy me. At this point, I qualified him as creepy. To my relief, he eventually walked away. Soon, it was my turn to pitch. Just then, another man showed up, also in his 40s. Let's call him man number two. Number two also had some comments on our baseball game. He was much more aggressive in his advice, though. Eventually, he came closer and closer until he stepped right up to me and started giving me pitching advice. I thought it was strange that he was so enthusiastic about this, but as a naive young boy, I had the habit of respecting and obeying adults by default. He started getting right up against my path and holding my wrists to show me how to pitch. 
You know, how you see in the movies, how the guy puts moves on the girls under the guise of teaching them something, like throwing a ball or swinging a golf club. Yeah, he was doing that to me. Now that I think about it, he was right up against my body, too. It was quite inappropriate, to say the least. I was starting to get very uncomfortable. What made it even worse is I could smell the alcohol lingering on him. As he was touching me inappropriately, in front of all my friends in broad daylight, I didn't know what to do. I don't know what my friends were thinking, but I remember it being very quiet. I suppose they were in a bit of shock as well. Not as much as I was, though. I think it's just a thing kids have to please people, especially adults. Kind of reminds me of that movie The Lovely Bones, where the predator uses kids' respect for adults against them, manipulating them. When I finally came over my initial shock, I backed away. Just then, I heard man number one shouting some obscenities at man number two. Man number one had returned. He came right at the other guy and started shoving him around. Man number two started to back away, cursing back at man number one, who was still scolding and cursing at him as well. He did some sort of flying kick into his back and sent him stumbling forward. This continued as their now fight moved out of the schoolyard. We watched them for a few minutes until man number two relented and disappeared. Man number one returned looking quite angry and shouted a few things to us. To be honest, I was still in shock and didn't understand what he was saying though. Finally, he walked away for good this time. Even though I was a little scrapper kid, for years thinking back on it, I felt foolish, violated, ashamed for letting someone put his hands on me like that. I realized later on that I must be grateful to that stranger, man number one, who had nothing better to do that day than sit in the sun shouting uninvited baseball comments at kids, but returned anyway to beat up and chase away a sexual predator trying to prey on a child. Whoever you are, I thank you. And to everyone else, please let kids know they aren't obligated to please or be polite to anyone that makes them feel uncomfortable in any way. They don't owe them anything. Encourage them to be strong and stand up for themselves. Let me start by saying that I was really only looking to hook up. I had just been dumped by my boyfriend and I'm not the bar type. I figured that an online dating service would be a reasonable option. I used a local personal service and had been talking to a guy for about two days before agreeing to meet up with him. His name was Mike and he told me he used online dating because he was suffering from depression and was on medication that made it hard for him to perform. He decided it was easier to meet girls this way than to meet up in person and have to explain when they started getting physical. He went on to tell me, though, that he had a good feeling about me and that I was exciting him despite his medication. Okay, I was cool with this. I decided to go over to his place to see if we really did have some chemistry. We both seemed to be looking for the same thing, a hookup. When I got there, he was waiting for me in the living room. We started making out and I could tell he was getting a little aroused, but he was having some issues. When he said he knew what would help and that it was in his bedroom, I willingly followed, walking in behind him. I couldn't help but notice his bed was surrounded by cat condos, lots of them. Some of them were structured to be as tall as I was. I knew that he had some cats, but I assumed he meant one or two and that they were just hiding when I came over. Nope, he had ten, which all came out from under the bed when we sat down on it. They all went over to their perches on the cat condos to watch us, after rubbing against him and being petted quickly. He then started to make out with me again, and was massively aroused at this point. I was a little bit creeped out though. I like cats, I have two myself. But having them watch me pee freaks me out, much less them all watching me have sex. I excused myself, openly admitting that this was a little bit too weird for me. 
I left and he followed after me. He begged me to give him another chance and to help him with his issues. I left and for the next several weeks he messaged me over and over, asking me to come over and saying that he had made some real progress with me. The final straw that made me block him was after receiving a photo of him nude on the bed doing unspeakable things with the cats. At that point, I blocked him and informed the authorities. That's not something I want to be messing with. I was driving through the California desert on my way to New Mexico, taking a shortcut. I found myself all alone on a two-lane road driving through the desolate landscape. There was nothing around for miles except for an abandoned ghost town. At the time, I had heard rumors the area was a hotspot for satanic group activity. It was the late evening and the sun was setting. Soon, it would be very dark. I was driving through a canyon with high grass on both sides of the road, when up ahead, I noticed something in the middle of the pathway, blocking my way forward. As I came closer, I slowed down to a crawl. There was a truck stopped sideways across both lanes on the road. There was an open suitcase, and clothes were scattered everywhere. Two bodies lay face down in the road. There was a single man and a woman. They appeared to be dead. I stopped a hundred feet or so from the scene of this accident. The hair on the back of my neck was standing on end. Something was wrong about this scene, but I couldn't put my finger on exactly what it was. I reached into the back seat and pulled out my rifle, loading around into the chamber. Then it hit me. The scene of this accident looked way too perfect. It was as if it had been staged. Was it some sort of ambush, or was I just being paranoid? I broke out into a cold sweat. My heart was pounding in my chest. Something was seriously wrong. I didn't dare to get out of my car. As I scanned the road, I saw a line I could drive where I could pass the body of the man lying down on the left, then swerve to the right side and pass the body of the woman. I dropped into first gear and punched the engine. I drove the line I had planned and passed the back of the truck without hitting it, or either of the bodies on the road. I continued forward for a few hundred feet, then slowed down so I could breathe and let my heart start to relax. As I looked in the rearview mirror, though, I suddenly realized the two bodies had gotten up to their knees. At least twenty shadowy figures were emerging from the tall grass on either side of the road. At that moment, I began to panic. My right foot stepped on the gas, and I sped off down the road. I didn't let up until I had to slow down, and I reached the highway. I'll never know what would have happened to me had I gotten out of the car to check on those bodies, or if I had stopped my car a bit closer to them. Somehow, I don't think it would have been good. Sometimes, real life can be much scarier than any horror movie ever was. I lived in a weird house as a kid, which resulted in chairs being moved in other rooms when I was the only one home. Kitchen cupboards opening late at night when no one else was awake. I could be sitting at the computer in a lit room at night and watch as a black cloud would float through a closed door and sit suspended in the air across the room from me. I had footsteps that would walk outside my door and loud breathing. I was so terrified as a child that I ended up sleeping with music playing so I could tune out all the noises. To this day, I still can't sleep without music playing. I probably could have convinced myself most of it was not real as I aged forward if it wasn't for a certain weird happening. It was about 11am in the morning. My younger brother and I were waiting at home while my mother was out doing jobs. We were waiting for her to come back to pick us up, so we were sitting by the front window waiting for her car. That was when we heard the radio begin playing from my brother's room. Neither of us understood why it had just started all of a sudden, so we walked to my brother's room. 
my brother hid behind me. I had to walk in first. The second I crossed the threshold, though, the radio went silent immediately. Upon closer inspection, we realized that it was not even plugged in at all. There were no batteries in the back of it either. There was no logical explanation for it to be playing. My brother, a young boy, had a bunch of matchbox cars and an old car playmat. He swore and declared that he had parked his cars neatly on it in lines, but when we went in, the cars were thrown all over. Luckily, we moved out of that house, but my brother and I still remember the radio saga clearly to this day. It's pretty much the only reason I know I wasn't completely crazy as a child. This happened a few months ago, when I was in my second year of junior high school. Hanging on the wall at the back of our classroom, there was a suggestion box. It was put there by the teacher, Miss Solomon, if any students had any ideas for improvements that could be made. We were supposed to write our opinions down in a letter and put it in the suggestion box. Then, Miss Solomon would read the letters and consider our proposals. One morning, when we came to class, someone had crossed out the suggestion part of the sign and written death there instead. The death box caused a bit of a stir in the classroom. Some of the students thought it was funny, but there were others who were a little bit disturbed by it. There were rumors that two boys, named Derek and Jamal, had done it as a prank. They were the types that were always causing mischief and disrupting the class. When the teacher confronted them about it, however, both of them denied it. Afterwards, I quietly asked them if they had really done it, and they still claimed they knew nothing about it. In the end, the teacher couldn't figure out who the culprit really was, and the matter was dropped. A few days later, Derek was found hanging by the neck in a classroom after school. He was dead. There was a note in the death box that read, Sorry for annoying everyone in the class. A few days after Derek's funeral, Jamal was also found hanging by the neck in the classroom as well. In the death box, there was another note that read, Sorry for annoying everyone in class. We were all shocked. None of us could understand why two of our classmates would suddenly commit suicide. It was very deeply disturbing. After that, when we came to school, the classroom seemed very creepy. All we could think about was what had occurred there. Soon after that, I transferred to a new school. I had to get used to the new classroom and trying to make a new group of friends. One day, when I got home after school and turned on the TV, I saw a breaking news report. It was about my previous school. Scrolling my eyes across the bottom of the screen, I saw the headline, Teacher Suicides. The news anchor was saying the teacher had killed themselves. The anchor was saying the teacher who committed suicide was the homeroom teacher of the two boys who had died as well. She left behind a suicide note that read, I always wanted to know what it would feel like to kill. Sorry for all the fuss. I stared at the screen in disbelief. According to the news report, Derek and Jamal had not killed themselves after all. They had been murdered by our teacher, Miss Solomon. Then she committed suicide. It was all too much to take in, and very hard to believe as well. Sure, sometimes Miss Solomon would scold the students for misbehaving, but she was usually very kind and gentle. Why would she do all of this? I felt a cold chill run down my spine. I had misbehaved just as much as Derek and Jamal. If I had not been transferred to a different school, perhaps I would have been her next victim. Just then, I heard the sound of the front door opening. My mother came home from work. As she walked into the room, I noticed she was carrying an envelope in her hand. There's a letter for you, she said. Why are you so pale? You look like you've seen a ghost or something. I didn't answer her. Instead, I took the letter and examined it. The envelope was blank and there was no address written on it. I opened it and found a note inside. It was written in big red letters. It said, you're lucky. Fifteen days have passed since then, and I'm still too afraid to set foot outside my front door. A 
I used to live in a house that backed up to a big public open space, where there were hiking trails, lots of joggers, and people walking their dogs. Anyway, one night I had a kind of creepy dream. An old lady came into my room and was trying to get me to come outside. The dream woke me up, and I got some water. I turned off my fan because it was cold, and then I fell asleep again. Instantly, I went right back into the same dream, with this old lady barging into my room and calmly saying, You have to go outside now. I kept telling her no, and that it was too cold. I woke up again. My fan was now on somehow. I figured I might have just thought I'd turned it off, or the button got stuck or something. I got up to turn the fan off again, and went back to sleep. This time, I had the exact same dream, except the woman was much older looking in this one, and was very agitated. She was yelling at me over and over, You have to go outside now! I got up in the dream and followed her to the hallway. When I got to the hallway, she wasn't there. And at that point, I woke up and realized I actually was standing in the hallway. I've never ever walked around in my sleep before or after this. Also, my fan was back on once more. When I got back to my room at this point, I was freaked out, so I got something to eat instead and watched TV for a couple of hours to calm down. I went back to bed around 5 or 6, and the dream did not come back again. The messed up part, though, is a couple of days later, I saw there were police cars in the open field space, and when I asked my mom what happened, she said they'd found an older woman. She'd been reported missing a few days before, must have had a heart attack or a stroke while out walking by the trail. They had found the body. So this happened years ago, when I was a dumb teen girl who loved walking the city alone after dark. This took place in Eastern Europe for context, in a city with a tramway station. On this one night, I sat in a tram station, waiting to catch the last tram home. Three trams stopped at this particular station, two of which went where I was going, important info for later. It was around 10 p.m., and as I sat there waiting, lost in thought, I barely registered a man, quietly walking up and standing by the shelter. I thought nothing of it, just someone else waiting for the tram as well. That was until I started feeling weird. The streets were quiet and dark, and there was no one else in sight, just me and this guy. I started wondering why he was choosing to stand this close to me when he had so much space available to avoid doing so. I couldn't comprehend anyone wanting to socialize this late at night, given that I was not very social myself. I glanced over at him, trying not to overthink this. He was a bald-headed, beady-eyed giant man, tall and built like a bear, big belly, big arms, and big legs. I was 5'2 and very scrawny, but that wasn't what scared me. It was the fact that he was just staring right at me, completely unblinking and expressionless, not even attempting to look away or acting embarrassed at all. No, this guy wanted me to feel uncomfortable. I instantly felt weak and shaky. Cold shivers ran down my spine. Something about this guy was not normal. I realized quickly this was not a good situation. I couldn't miss that last tram. Walking home was out of the question now, and my phone was almost dead. I was a shy kid and didn't have what it took to scare this guy away. I knew that, but I at least had to try something. I only managed to mutter a small, hi, trying my best to startle him out of whatever he was thinking. Sadly, my attempt failed in the face of his silent and threatening aura. He kept staring, no sign of intent to reply. He was clearly enjoying this, though. Feeling the panic rising inside me, I told myself to stay calm and think rationally. Maybe he just didn't hear me. Minutes passed by, but his unblinking stare continued to burn holes in my skin. There was no tram in sight, 
and ignoring him clearly was not working. I mustered up the courage to speak once again, this time much louder. What do you want from me? Stop staring! No answer. He definitely heard me this time. I found myself starting to get angry. I didn't want to let this guy get to me anymore. I didn't want to continue to give him the satisfaction of watching me squirm nervously and pretending his behavior didn't bother me. I took a deep breath and forced myself to start thinking. I knew what I couldn't do. I clearly couldn't fight him off if he made a move, and there was nothing I could say or do probably that would get him to stop. I didn't know what his true intentions were, but clearly he was not a good guy. If I tried to walk away, he would probably follow. I could run, but he would most likely catch up to me before I could tire him out, since his legs were much bigger than mine. Even if I managed to somehow lose him, walking home through dark alleys past junkies that were always prowling about could land me in an even worse situation. I could pretend to call someone, but maybe he would feel compelled to act much sooner if he felt threatened. So what could I do? The only thing I could realistically do was try and outsmart him somehow. I started developing a few plans, depending on which tram showed up and when, trying to confirm whether he was just amusing himself and actually waiting for the tram too, or had popped over for more suspicious reasons. Obviously, I couldn't let him know where I lived, so if he followed me, I'd have to be prepared to employ whatever strategy available. For that, I needed to stay aware of my surroundings. While I was still thinking, the first tram showed up. It was one I could have taken home, but this one pulled into the depot right in my neighborhood, which would force me to lead him to my home if he followed me on board. I hoped he would board this one and leave me be, but of course he didn't. He kept watching me carefully. I let the tram go, desperately hoping it was not the last one to head home. He continued to watch me. I could sense he was happy with how things were going. I put up with it for another 15 minutes, trying to focus on another plan of action. I could pretend I needed the other tram, the one going to a different area of the city and ride it to the next station, getting off as soon as possible so I didn't end up too far and miss the tram I actually did need. This tram showed up next. With my heart in my throat, I boarded it and sat down by the door. Of course, he got on too. He sat himself in the back pretty far from where I was. I let out a sigh of relief, thinking this might still go well. When the tram reached the next station, I got up and out, not looking back and hoping it was all over. When I stepped onto the pavement and watched the tram drive away though, I could see he was not on it. I turned my head slowly and was terrified to see him now walking towards me, looking extremely angry. He stopped a few steps away and just continued staring at me, this time with a clear hint of malice though, still in complete silence. My vision blurred as I fought back tears. Clearly, this guy was not just going to let me go. The helplessness I felt was unbearable, but I had to find a way. I had to get home tonight. The prospect of what might happen to me any time now if I didn't was becoming all too real. My head was full of unanswered questions, regrets, and horrible scenarios. I saw the final tram approaching, the only one I could take now. I got on as quickly as my trembling legs would allow me to. When I was in and the bright lights enveloped me, my mind snapped out of its spiral of fear and allowed me a moment of clarity. I had three stops to figure out what to do. I sat down at the front and looked at the driver. He was a frail old man, blissfully unaware of my distress. Getting the driver's attention was a no-go. We passed one stop, and no one else climbed aboard. I turned around, fully expecting to see the psycho had followed me again. What I did not expect was him to be sitting right behind me. He was not taking any chances. He was making sure I would not try anything like last time. I shot him a hateful glare and allowed my anger to overcome my fear. I stood up and walked over to another seat in the middle of the tram car. He got up too and slowly walked to a spot two seats behind me, then sat down with an arrogant grin on his face. Already expecting this though, I got up again and stood by the middle door instead, determined to keep him on his toes. 
If I stood right by the door, he wouldn't have any idea which station I planned to get off at. This time, he remained where he was. I guess he was convinced I was bluffing. After all, this really was the last tram. There was nothing else I could do to escape now. At least, that's what he must have reckoned. My defiance was just a funny act to him. This was my chance, though. I had to take a risk, and it had to work. There were three doors on the tram. They all opened and closed at the same time, and stayed open for five seconds before closing again. That was if no buttons were pressed or people detected on the threshold. The next stop, the only one left before mine, came into view. The tram slowed to a stop. The doors opened and I made no move. Five long seconds passed. The door started to close. I bolted and ran for it, reaching the back door as fast as I could and slamming the button to open it again. My whole body tense with adrenaline. I waited a long painful second and jumped back in, keeping my head low, holding my breath and crouching behind the nearest seat. I shut my eyes tightly and exhaled while thanking the gods I didn't believe in for that button working. I wished with all my might for him to have not seen me before I jumped back in. As I was waiting to hear his footsteps approaching, I pictured him frantically looking for me. Was he still on the tram? Was he catching his breath on the pavement of the last station? As the tram continued its loud journey, banging and clanging in sync with my heartbeat, I dared myself to look up. As I stealthily peeked around the corner, I found no one looking back. I stood up in excitement and threw myself at the foggy back window. There he was, standing alone and victimless on that slowly fading out of sight station, watching me leave him and his vile plans behind. Giving someone the middle finger through a window never felt so good. I made it home and told no one my story, for fear I'd be admonished for my naivete. I was safe though, and very proud of myself. I also learned my lesson. Let me start this story by saying this happened almost three years ago, when I was still pregnant with my first child. Since I had just gotten married and my mother's house had no space for another two members, I mostly stayed at home with the occasional trips to the national park or casual strolls around the neighborhood. My husband stayed home until 6pm, then would be off to work. It wasn't the ideal post-marriage scenario I'd had in my dreams, but it did the job. I can't quite remember if it was late or not. I was home alone watching TV. My husband was away at work, and my sister was at the supermarket. It was all quiet, until I noticed our water dispenser's bottle was almost empty. I called the delivery service and went back to watching TV. After a few minutes, I heard the doorbell ring. I was relieved since I was dying of thirst at that point. I made my way towards the front door when I noticed two things that raised some huge red flags for me. First, I could hear what clearly was a car engine and I knew the water bottles were delivered on a motorcycle with a small cart attached to its back. Second, I could hear someone on the phone saying something along the lines of, we're here for something. Now, my sister's house was by no means in a dangerous part of town, but it wasn't exactly the most peaceful neighborhood either. Burglaries were not really unheard of, and there had been some murders, although those were the result of heated discussions between drug addicts. Back to the story. I thought maybe I was overthinking the whole situation. Maybe it was some of my friends coming to visit me. I quickly scratched this theory off, though, when I asked who it was, a raspy voice said, The water guy! Not taking any chances, I slowly made my way back out the living room and closed the door. They didn't ring the doorbell nor call me, but I could still hear the car engine and their shadows from below the door lingered for what seemed like an eternity. I heard the car doors open after a while and close multiple times. That could mean there was more than one person. Then, the car drove off. I was still freaked out, but relieved that they were now gone. Whatever their intentions were, 
Not long after this, the real water delivery guy arrived. I asked if he had sent someone earlier, but she immediately declined. My heart sank. I stood there while he delivered the water bottles, trying to find an explanation for all of this. Thankfully, nothing else happened. Some weeks later, I saw in the local newspaper that a group of criminals had been arrested for attempted break-ins. Apparently, their MO was passing off as sanitary maintenance workers or other random services in the area, then forcefully entering the house after the owner opened the door. What scares me the most, however, was the fact that they knew I had asked for water delivery. Maybe it was just a coincidence, or maybe they had been spying on me as I made the call. Not exactly unlikely, since I wasn't being silent on the phone or anything. Either way, I'm glad I picked up on the red flags and returned to the living. When my mother was younger, she went out on a blind date. Her date took her to a restaurant, and although he was nice enough, she just wasn't that into him. Halfway through the meal, she was already so bored that she was thinking of excuses so she could leave early. The waiter could tell she was bored and kept smiling and winking at her the whole time. While my mom's date was away in the restroom, the waiter approached her and started asking her if she was okay. She explained that she was on a blind date, but she wasn't having that much fun. It turned out the waiter was just about to get off work. He offered to give my mother a ride home if she waited for another 10 minutes. She considered it and was tempted to say yes, but just then her blind date came back from the restroom. She shook her head and smiled at the waiter and told him no thanks. Mom and her date finished their meals and he drove her home just fine. The next day, my mom happened to be watching the evening news. There was a news flash saying that a woman had been found murdered behind a restaurant the night before. She realized it was the exact same restaurant she had been at with her date. They then said the police had already caught the killer. A picture then flashed upon the screen. As you can probably guess, the waiter was the murderer. About three years ago, I was driving to my dad's house from across state in Pennsylvania. He lived far out in the country, down a desolate paved road that crossed with an old dirt road, as well as some unused railroad tracks. The entire area was surrounded by deep woods and unused farming fields. There were a couple of dilapidated old houses, an old well, and a few old cemeteries nearby. I arrived at those crossroads I mentioned just a bit earlier, after having been on the road for about four hours. It was around 1 or 2 a.m. by this point, and I decided to pull over and quickly relieve myself. I stopped my truck about 60 feet from said crossroad, close to a small farm shed with some old equipment in it. There was a single light bulb on in the side of the shed, providing the only source of light in the nearby pitch black darkness of the night. On the opposite side of the road from the shed was a steep drop off into a ditch, on the other side of which were some very dense woods. As I was relieving myself in the dark by this shed, I was suddenly overwhelmed by a massive feeling of dread. It almost felt like someone had just punched me directly in the gut. I had been around these woods all my life and used to walk around that area at night as a teenager. I assure you, I had never felt so scared as I did in that exact moment. I quickly finished up my business, and goaded by my sudden sense of panic, I ran back to my truck, jumped in, and locked the doors. I flicked the headlights on and cranked the engine so badly you could hear the gears grinding. All I cared about was getting out of there as soon as possible though. Right as I began to turn back onto the road from the shoulder, my headlights shone over the ditch and picked up something on the other side of the road, about a foot from the asphalt. My stomach immediately sank again. There was something crawling out of that ditch. 
whatever it was, was hunkered down on all fours like an animal. But its body looked like a human being. Actually, it looked like a human that was attempting to mimic a stalking animal. They looked sickly as well. They reminded me of someone with jaundice. They had no hair that I could see. Their head was just a shiny oval. Their mouth was smiling very wide, almost in a thin straight line that extended all the way across their face. It was very, very unsettling. Their eyes were dilated to the point they were just small like two black pinpoints. Since I was around seven feet from it, you can imagine I was very startled upon seeing this. As soon as my lights hit them, I could tell by their movements that they had been in the process of slowly creeping up the ditch to the road. When my lights hit, they sort of retracted slightly, like they were surprised they had been discovered. Needless to say, I didn't stick around long enough to see what was about to go down next. I hit the gas and flew all the way to my dad's house and stayed up the entire night, freaked out as hell. The part of this experience that still utterly scares me to this day is that whoever I saw was definitely stalking up that ditch to get me, and I had my back completely turned to them. I can't possibly explain what had triggered those emotions when I stood there in the darkness with my guard completely down. The only thing that came close to that sudden realization of grave danger was when I was nearly struck by a speeding car on a city street many years ago. I don't know what could have happened if I'd lingered around a few minutes longer, but I'd rather not have to think about it. I've never spoken on this, not even to my parents or anyone around me. I'm a 22-year-old male, and this happened when I was 14, all the way through the age of 15. My friends and I would always hang out at the local mall during our free time. One day, I had arrived a bit earlier than my friends and was waiting at a seating area in the food court. There were a couple of couches around each other, and it was a common area for anyone to come and sit. I didn't really notice much when a man came over and sat down at a couch across from me. I was sitting on my phone, not paying attention, until he spoke up and said something along the lines of, Do you come here often? I looked up to see a man who was in his late 50s to early 60s. I told him I often did with my friends, and he then introduced himself. I still remember his first name, as it was exactly the same as my dad's. I didn't get any initial weird feelings. The man seemed normal enough, and I had no reason to be weirded out by him. I told him my name and we started making small talk. I'm a fairly sociable person and have been since a young age, so I was fine with talking to what I assumed was just a kind older man wanting to chat with someone. He started asking me about the things I like to do. I said I enjoyed going to the local lake and fishing and swimming, to which he said he went out to the same area every weekend and enjoyed the same things as well. I said I enjoyed making music. He said he liked making music also. I told him I was an avid piano player, and he excitingly told me he had a piano at his house. As I started to say more things, to each and every one he replied he enjoyed doing them also. It felt normal at first, but as we kept talking I kept getting a weirder and weirder feeling. It was like every single thing he said was trying to prove something to me and win me over. He said he had a boat at the lake and we should go sometime together. He even said he lived right across the street from the mall and that I was welcome to stop by and play his piano. Even going as far as to tell me the complex he lived in and how to get there from the mall. He said if I'd like to go over that same day and play his piano, I was more than welcome to. With every passing minute, he was pressing harder and harder for me to come hang out with him. Talking with him honestly started to give me the weirdest primitive instinct feeling ever, like I was staring at the face of evil or bad intentions. After five to ten minutes of talking with him, I lied and said my friends had now arrived, and I was going to go find them. He somewhat sadly said okay and wished me well. A couple of weeks go by, 
and my friends and I go to the mall once again. We were all walking through, when out of the corner of my eye, I see the exact same man. He had his hoodie pulled down covering his face and was walking past us in the opposite direction. We locked eyes for a split second and my heart immediately dropped. I didn't look back though and honestly forgot about it soon after. For the next two months or so though, I would keep seeing him randomly appearing at the mall. I kept brushing it off as a coincidence. There are definitely regulars there who come very often. I really didn't think too much of seeing him as he'd never tried to approach me since the first day. Occasionally though, I'd look over and see him and he'd be staring at me. I was very naive. I always got a semi-weird feeling anytime I saw him, but I always just brushed it off. That was until one day. I went to the mall with my friends like usual, and we hung out for a few hours before all leaving and going home our separate ways. I got home and went into my room. No one else was home with me, and I would be by myself for a couple of hours. My mom gets home around 7 to 8 p.m., and comes into my room looking somewhat worried, asking if I'd noticed a man outside. I said no, and she then showed me her phone. We have two cameras, one in the front of the house and one in the back. About 20 minutes after I'd gotten home, someone sneakily approached our house. We lived off a very busy street, and our front wall blocks a majority of the view in. We did not see a car park or anything, just a random man walking up to our house from the street. The camera was located near our front door looking out to the driveway, so as the man got closer, I realized it was the same guy I had been seeing at the mall. I immediately felt sick to my stomach. He came and looked through the front door glass. He walked over to the side of our house near our driveway and left the view of the camera. I remember there was nothing on the back camera either so he must have stayed by the side of our house for quite a while. My room was not located over there, so I have no idea what he could have been doing. He then came back around after a while and looked through the front door again before walking away. I don't know if I was just too embarrassed or scared to say anything, but I said I didn't notice and didn't even know who it was. My mom found it weird he was looking into our house, but said it could have been a homeless guy or a druggie. We did love off a busy street with a bus stop right in front of our house. I just went with that. My dad added more security cameras after this to deter people, and I never admitted to seeing him before. After he showed up to my house though, it was confirmed to me that he was following me around. I don't know what his intentions were, but he never came back to the house. We moved to a different part of the city not long after, and it was too far to go to that mall again. I've not seen him ever since, and I wish to never do so again. When I was 15, I was in a really bad mental headspace. With that being said, I was depressed, lonely, and desperate for anyone's attention. Against my own better judgment, I made an account on plenty of fish. I understand that I put myself in a dangerous position for predators, but I also understand that any man who I told my age should have reported my account and not spoken to me at all. After swiping left and right for about an hour, I met a man I'll call Red. Red was 26, a father of two beautiful toddlers, and a Puerto Rican native who had recently moved to Florida. He spoke a fair bit of English and had this charm to him whenever he spoke. When I told him my age, it's scary now to think about just how okay he was with it. He simply told me we would not have any sexual relations and our interactions would be 100% innocent. We talked for a few months before even mentioning meeting up. When I talked to Red, I felt happy, whole, like I finally had someone supporting me. The first few times we met up, it was perfectly fine. We went to the outlets, Disney Springs, the movies. He was a perfect gentleman. He held my hand, opened doors for me, and kept his hands off me too. We did kiss a bit, but it was never anything too intense. 
About six months into our relationship, I turned 16, and I invited him over to my house, through means of sneaking in my window, of course. He agreed wholeheartedly. We were just hanging out watching a movie, when he kissed me in a way he never had before, in a way I'd never been kissed before. It was surprising, and without having to be said, overwhelming. I started to get scared. It finally hit me that this was a grown man, and I was still just a child. I got off my bed and told him he had to leave. I wasn't ready for this. His face immediately contorted into anger, and he stepped towards me, trying to convince me through gritted teeth not to make him leave. He reached out to grab my shoulders, and out of instinct, I shoved his chest to make him back off, only for a harsh shove to be returned right at me. A hot, sharp pain suddenly overwhelmed me, spreading from the back of my head and down the rest of my body. Then everything went black. The next thing I knew, I was hearing a blood-curdling scream. Hazed out and too weak to open my eyes fully, I could just barely tell it was my mom. I felt a wetness on my head, and my body felt so cold now. It was just as I gathered that something was really wrong, that I lost consciousness again. The following time that I awoke was in a hospital bed. My head was pounding and aching in the back. I reached up hazily to feel where the pain was coming from, and my fingertips grazed a row of staples on a now bald patch on the back of my head. It made me wince. Things went by fast from that point on. A doctor and my mother and father explained that I must have slipped and hit my head on the windowsill, being that's where the first impact was made. Before falling the rest of the way onto my floor, my mom had come to my room to wake me up for school in the morning and found me laying there in a pool of my own blood. She thought I was dead because my breathing was so faint. They had no idea as to why I'd slipped and I was too embarrassed and ashamed of myself to tell anyone. I didn't think I deserved justice for what Red did to me. Later on, I found out my obstacles from the injury, hearing loss in my right ear, as well as an inability to retain old memories. This event and a flash of memories from my childhood are the last things I remember from before the incident. Though I was saddened by this, I was happy to be alive and to never see Red again. Now being 18, a few months ago I signed up for plenty of fish once more. I kept my weariness this time though and didn't actually go on any dates. I looked out for warning signs and upon the first blocked just about everyone. One day I received a message and I could see it was from Red. I had blocked him on any other platform, including his number. It simply said, Hey, how have you been? I didn't respond, but I looked at his profile. It still said he was 26 years old. I had a feeling he lied to me about his real age. Perhaps I didn't know anything about this man at all. After all, he must have thought he killed me, and he still selfishly ran off, without even attempting to see if I was still alive. This is something that happened to me a month ago. It's still fresh in my mind, and quite frankly, still gives me the chills whenever I go into work to this day. Some background before I go into this story. I'm a female, who also happens to be gay. I have a girlfriend, and we both had promise rings. Rings that we show off to anybody that leans toward the flirtier side, or tells us they want to take us out on a date or something like that. Anyway, I work at a small mom-and-pop coffee shop in a small community. There's a few co-workers and a lovely boss that treats all of us very well. We all got along well and even went out together outside of work just to hang out and have a good time. There was one co-worker that I was rather close to, and I'm now even closer to to this day, Matt. Matt is a tall guy, taller than me even, and I'm six foot. He had a slim but muscular build. He was a super nice guy, and we've been great friends ever since he started working at the shop with us. We get all sorts of people coming in there. 
mostly middle-class or upper-class people that tend to be very nice, apart from the picky, entitled assholes, of course. There were also a few strangers that blow in from out of town from time to time. No big deal. We had a regular come in almost every weekend. I'll call him James. James was a rather good-looking guy, however, a lot older than I was. Let's say that I'm old enough to be in college, but not quite old enough to drink yet. According to my boss, he came around the shop about once every other week to treat himself, but ever since I'd started working there, he came in every weekend to buy a small coffee or some random pastry to snack on. My boss joked saying it must be because he had a crush on me. I laughed it off at the time, but I probably should not have. Whenever I was at the register, he would get this huge smile on his face and ask me about my day. I would reply with the standard small talk and make his order so I could continue doing whatever else I had to do. If I wasn't at the register though, he would wait until I was done doing whatever I was doing so I could cater to him only. He refused to let anybody but me help him at the register. I thought that was a little weird and had some small red flags going off, but not enough for me to really get paranoid. Then he started asking me the snooping personal questions, though. He would ask me about where I was going to school, if I lived in the neighborhood that was five minutes away, what my favorite flowers were. At this point, I was uncomfortable with all his questions and gave very vague answers. I just outright ignored the prodding about my favorite flowers and what school I went to. I casually brought up that my girlfriend and I were planning to go on a date at some point. I even showed him the ring she gave to me so he could see very well it wasn't just some made-up thing. His entire attitude immediately changed. He went from all smiles to a straight face and monotone voice as he snatched his coffee from me and briskly walked out the door. I felt triumphant. I figured that would be the end of it. I volunteered to take out the trash to the large bins outside. The back of the shop was surrounded by other buildings that were also little restaurants and bars. They all used the same bins, and it was rare to encounter anybody else when you're going out to dump the trash bags. Sometimes the other workers would be out having a smoke, but that wasn't until later at night and the coffee shop usually closed around 5 in the afternoon. I went outside at around 1, as I was lugging the large bags outside. I noticed a man standing in the center of the sidewalk a few feet away. Tons of people walked their dogs around that area, so I didn't really think twice about it. That was until I took a double take after throwing the bags in the bin. It was James. He was just standing there staring at me, and with my chronic anxiety and paranoia, something in me told me I needed to stop looking and start booking back to the shop. Just as I turned around to start fast walking back, I heard large lunging footsteps running toward me, and I instantly picked up speed. Right as I bolted up the steps and opened the door to the shop, I turned around and slammed it. I saw James was right behind me, and about to stop the door until I shut it. I locked it behind me, hyperventilating due to the panic attack that was coming. Matt was working with me that day, and heard me crying and struggling to breathe in the back. He called my girlfriend for me so she could help calm me down. Although I'm taller than her, she was definitely the tough one out of the two of us. She could take a man twice her size due to all the training she'd done since she was a kid whereas I didn't know how to fight at all. I relayed back to her what had happened, and of course she was livid. She couldn't come over though due to her being still at work, so she asked Matt to help me process what happened as we continued working. Over the next few weeks, James would come back and act like nothing had happened at all. One week though, he just stopped coming altogether. He didn't come in for another three weeks. I was getting nervous because something told me he was cooking up something really big and really bad. Now, I only worked weekends at this point due to me being in school. Matt worked both weekends and two days during the week, so I asked him to see if James would be coming in those two days. He obliged and said he would let me know. I didn't get any texts during the week, 
and a feeling of dread was building up in my chest that I had to work that weekend. Friday, just as I was opening the shop, alone, mind you, the next person would not be coming in until half an hour after me. In walks James. Technically, we didn't even open until the second person comes in, but we sometimes let a couple of customers in early, since they only want their coffee of the day and then take off. That meant the stupid front door was already unlocked. I was terrified to my very core. I never open alone, and the one time I did, James somehow knew this and took it as his chance. As I saw him walking up, I texted to my boss to look at the cameras and tell Matt to hurry up because I did not want to be alone with this guy. He started his usual small talk and I obliged, not wanting to set him off. He started going on about how pretty I was, comparing me to random models. I just kind of nodded and thanked him. His demeanor switched again. He wasn't straight-faced, nor did he change his tone, but there was something in his eyes that told me he was calculating what he was going to do next, depending on how I answered. Now, I'm not a quick thinker when under pressure, especially not when I'm scared like this. I did mention that James was good-looking and older, but he was also way more muscular than I was. I knew that if he was going to grab me, I had to do everything I could to wiggle my chubby self out of his grasp. If he jumped over the counter or tried to run around the back, I'd have to grab one of the knives we used when making the food. He started saying how he wanted to take me out, and he would treat me so much better than this so-called girlfriend of mine that I should call her and break up with her right now. That took me by surprise, and he knew by the look on my face, because this time he slammed his fist against the counter and screamed, Call the bitch right now or you'll fucking regret it. I was on the verge of tears. I picked up my phone, opening Matt's contact and calling him, praying he would pick up. Someone or something must have been on my side that day, because he picked up on the very first ring. Hello? Hey, baby, there's something I need to tell you. What? What are you talking about? I was sweating, trying not to look at James too much, as he seemed pretty satisfied I'd actually listen to him. His arms crossed as I held back my tears. I know we've been dating for a while now, but there's a guy I met at the shop and it made me realize, I don't think I can keep this relationship up with you anymore. Matt instantly picked up on how shaky my voice was, and the small innuendo I made that I was not alone right now. I could hear him running down the stairs of his house and jingling his car keys. Don't hang up the phone, I'm coming! That fucking prick is gonna get what's coming to him! Matt lived in the same neighborhood I did, which was only a few minutes away. I prayed to whoever that he was breaking every speed limit out there to back me up. I know you're upset. No, it isn't you, it's me. I paused now and then acted like there was a legit conversation happening. The longer I stayed on the phone, though, the more suspicious James had started to become. He uncrossed his arms and started making his way towards the small opening that led to the area where we worked. My skin was crawling as I tried to act like I was going to abruptly end the call. I hung up the phone and put my phone back in my pocket, raising my hands to show I wasn't going to do anything. The way James was looking at me, I'd only ever encountered that look once. It was something I never wanted to see again. I simply shook my head, my eyes now and then quickly looking towards the front to spot Matt's car. For a moment, it was just a heavy silence, hanging in the air. Then, before I knew it, James was throwing the small knickknacks on the counter at me in a fit of rage. He was screaming that I should have never had a girlfriend in the first place. It should have always been him. I panicked and grabbed one of the knives in the drawer, putting some distance between him and I. I'm gay, you moron. I like girls. I don't want your saggy, limp, microscopic Spit was flying out of my mouth as the adrenaline slowly turned into anger. I was so mad my glasses started to fog up before James could even hop the counter, and he looked like he was ready to murder me. The back door slammed open. Matt came in holding a metal bat. He shouted that if the man didn't get the fuck out right now before the cops arrived, he would gladly beat the shit out of him. I instantly ran over to Matt and stood behind him. 
Just as James was about to lunge for the both of us, the red and blue lights outside made him think twice. He bolted towards the back door. Matt tried to block him, but it didn't work. Just as the cops burst inside, James was already gone. By then, I was a shaking mess. The adrenaline that had been holding me together was now completely gone. I fell to the floor and started to sob. Matt once again called my girlfriend, who thankfully was off that day and rushing from her place in the city to come see me. The one of the cops tried their best to calm me down, while the other was talking to Matt and asking for a description, telling us another car was patrolling the area and trying to find him. Apparently, he had come to the shop on foot. They found his car parked several streets away from the center, where all the restaurants were. My boss came in as soon as they could, and handed over the security footage they had gotten from that morning. I was allowed to go home for the rest of the day. I chose to go to my girlfriend's place just in case. They told me that if I ever saw James in my area, or my girlfriend's area, to not hesitate to call them again. My boss also posted his face outside the shop as well as inside to let people know that if they saw this man to call the police and that he was not allowed to be inside, especially during weekends. It just makes me think that if Matt didn't live so close by, if I hadn't stalled the man for as long as I had, what would he have done to me? Would he have hurt me in the shop? Or dragged me all the way back to his car and taken me somewhere else? I truly believe this man had something sinister planned for me. Let me preface this story with a few things. I'm not the best writer and I've not shared this before, nor do a lot of people know this even happened to me. I'm turning 22 at the end of the month, and this event happened almost a decade ago. I still remember it so clearly though. I still think on it often and bring it up to my family, as uncomfortable as it makes all of us. It reminds us of how dangerous the world really is. As a little bit of backstory, growing up I'd always had extremely fair skin, blonde hair, and light eyes. The kind of thing that specific creeps really go for. When I was just around the bend of becoming a teenager, my older sister, who was eight years ahead of me, was in the military and had been gone for quite some time now. Soon, though, she was finally coming back home to old USA soil, a few states away at a base in Kentucky. My parents and I were very excited and planned to leave for the weekend. We could finally go see her for the first time in years. It would only be for a few days, but we were happy regardless. We ended up spending time with her, of course, and had a few days to be able to go out to eat, open her accumulated Christmas presents, and go to a nearby mall in proximity to the hotel we'd been at. I've never seen someone so happy just to wear regular civilian clothes. I digress, though. Right from the get-go, our last night together felt odd as we walked this mall. I guess it was just one of those creepy vibes you get when in an unfamiliar area. It wasn't too long until closing, and at this time frame, malls closed at about 10 p.m. or so. I'm sure you know what happens at malls. You go in and you look at everything. Unbeknownst to us at the time, the four of us came across the last store we would be stopping at for the night before leaving. We walked in, and it was not a particular store we'd usually go to, Something about expensive streetwear clothing. Being the pesky 12-year-old I was, I was going back and forth pestering my mom and dad while walking around the store as my sister looked around as well. Suddenly, my sister walked over to my mother and whispered something in her ear. A man with the most well-defined black mustache I can remember had been tailing us and doing the typical retail routine. Hi, is there anything I can help you with? Can I help you find anything? He was being a little too persistent, though, and only ever asking my dad these things. The man didn't quite speak broken English, but his accent was very thick. Perhaps Indian or Turkish, maybe. My sister and mother walked out of the store and kept eyeing back at my dad. They were giving him the, all right, let's go now look. 
Me being 12, I was feeling even worse vibes. I didn't understand why my mom and sister were wanting to leave so badly, but I went to catch up with them regardless. As my dad noticed us all leaving, he began to walk out as well, but the man stopped him as I was still in earshot. I found out this man had been staring at me almost the whole time. He looked away from me, back to my dad, and then asked him this, How much for the little one? My dad, visibly confused, chuckled uncomfortably, thinking it was some kind of really tasteless joke. My mother and sister didn't hear this, and were still waiting for myself and my dad to catch up several feet away. What? My dad furrowed his brow and replied, hoping for some kind of explanation. The man proceeded to say he wanted to purchase me. Visibly angry now, and realizing the man was completely serious, he said, We don't do that here! He started hurrying me away to my mom and sis, and we started leaving as he told them what just happened. The whole drive back to the hotel, my sister was getting consistently more upset, saying if she'd have known, she would have killed the fucker. Honestly, I'm not sure there's really anything we could have done, though. Regardless, the entire situation was entirely fucked up, especially now that I'm old enough to realize the implications of what was going on. I moved to California in May. Having lived in Utah for most of my life, this was obviously a big change for me. Where I'm from, it's fairly safe. You can walk home at night and not have to worry about a thing. Everyone warned me how dangerous this new area can be, and to always be vigilant. I carry pepper spray with me at all times. I'd never really had any issues though, that is, until tonight. I ride the fast transit train system often, usually at least a few times a week. To get there from my apartment, I have to walk about a mile, most of which is an enclosed trail that runs behind the neighborhood next to the train tracks. There's one entrance at one end, one in the middle, and one at the other end which opens up to the train station parking lot. Last week, as I was walking home around 10 p.m., I had to walk past a man who was pretty obviously homeless. It seemed like he was searching for something he had lost, and talking to himself as well. I had to walk past him to get home. I tried to put my head down and quickly walk past without him noticing. As I did so, though, he blocked my way immediately. Excuse me? Hey, you! Did you see a thing about this big? He gestured with his hands. Did you see it when you were walking through here? Confused, I told him no and hurried to walk away. I could hear him trying to say something further to me, but I kept on going. Luckily, he did not follow. A few days later, though, I encountered him again on the same trail. He tried to stop me once more, but I simply told him, Sorry, I don't know what you're looking for. I kept on going. Tonight, though, as I walked to the train station, he was coming out of the elevator as I was going down the escalator. He started yelling at me. Excuse me! Hey, you! Ma'am! I ignored him, but he followed and wouldn't leave me alone. I turned around frustrated and finally asked him what he wanted. Hey, did you see my speaker? You know, since you were on the trail that night? I told him no, and I didn't have any idea what he was talking about. But why don't you just let me look in your backpack real quick, cause you're looking real guilty right now. Obviously, I told him no. He got furious and took a step towards me. I pulled out my pepper spray. You better leave me alone. I will spray you. He started screaming about how he didn't care and how I better not have any of his shit. Still though, he walked away in the end. I walked to the far end of the platform and called my roommate to inform her about what was happening. All of a sudden, the guy comes rushing back to me, clearly holding a hatchet he was trying to poorly hide under his jacket. I grabbed my pepper spray once more. I told him to back the fuck away, because I was not playing around. He shoved his hatchet back into his jacket and started backing away. My roommate called the transit police for me. 
I could still hear the guy screaming from somewhere upstairs in the station. Luckily, my train pulled up right then, and I hopped on without further incident. I'm hoping I never meet that hatchet guy again. I never learned what fucking speaker he was talking about either. This happened in what I'd like to say was 2017 or so. I was around 13, and I was walking home from school. My mom worked late at the time, and my father was out on a business trip. My brother's college was farther away too, so he always came home half an hour to an hour later than me. When I had to go home by myself, I would always take this shortcut there. It was an enclosed path which rarely any people used. As I walked down this day, there was a man a few steps behind me. Since I was a young, dumb child, I didn't really think anything of it. When the enclosed path ended and connected to the sidewalk, I saw the man climb into a white van. Getting slightly suspicious now, I started running over to my house, only to notice the van was now following me. To be sure it was following me and I wasn't just being paranoid, I took a couple of wrong turns, but the van stuck right behind me. I took a detour and when I thought I lost him, I ran back to my house and locked all my doors and windows once inside. I looked back out the window and I saw the white van lingering. I frantically called my mother and my brother. My mom wouldn't be home for another few hours and my brother had another half hour left. My mom told me to go to my parents' room and grab the gun. I went into my parents' room and went to their closet. I had to take it out of the lockbox. Mind you, the closest thing I'd ever done to shooting was archery. Prepared with this gun, I now went downstairs. I grabbed a knife as well, just in case. I went over to the window, only to see a man trying to peek inside. I pointed the gun directly at him and told him that if he did not leave right now, I would shoot him. He turned around and ran away. My brother finally came home a short time after. I told him what happened. We looked over the security camera footage and saw the man trying to get in through the back door, then giving up and coming to the window to try and find another way in. After my mom came home, we called the cops and they tried to trace his license plate number. I would see that same white van passing by my house every day until the police actually finally caught him. It turned out he was an escaped convict who was high on something. Good morning, my name is Antoine and I'm 32 years old. I prefer to apologize in advance if I make any mistakes, as English is not my first language. This story happened in 2021. I'll give you some context first. It was a Sunday and I had a date with a young woman who I had been seeing for a few weeks now. It was going pretty well. Spoiler alert, it ended quite quickly after this. Despite the restrictions going on at the time, we shared quite a bit of time around Paris. Going to restaurants, bars, cinemas, all of which were closed, we would just meet up outside of them. We were on the banks of the Seine when we decided to sit down a bit. We saw a free bench. We stayed there for about half an hour. A woman of about 50 years old who was sitting on the next bench over came towards us and told me that a girl behind us had been staring at me ever since we'd sat down. Curious, I turned around and looked for said girl. She must have been in her early 20s. She looked at me with a big grin on her face, not even blinking at all. She had faded red hair. This detail really stood out to me, because women with red hair really make me melt. Well, this particular woman was making me more uncomfortable. I laughed about it with my date and we decided to resume our walk. 
Hand in hand, we moved forward slowly, and I made her laugh by talking about random stupid things. I felt something was wrong, though. My date shook my hand worriedly, telling me that the girl was still following us. Pretending not to have noticed, I discreetly looked behind me. Indeed, this stranger was right there, following us only ten meters away. Worried, we quickened our pace, but it seemed this girl was not going to allow a distance to establish itself. Arriving near the Alma Bridge, we started running up and trying to lose her. Still hurrying, we crossed. We were about halfway through when I turned around. I could still see the red-haired stranger following us from a distance away. We hurried to the metro to return to St. Lazare. I don't think I need to tell you that she got on the exact same train as us. I reassured my date, telling her that it was me she was looking at, and that she probably had some problem with me. I'm a fairly large person. I told myself that if it came down to it, I could defend myself from this girl easily. I got out of the train car, and the stranger did the same. I hurried onward, thinking I could lose her, but she was really sticking to me. My date was still worried, so I lied by telling her I had lost the girl. Emily, if you're reading this, I'm sorry. I didn't want to worry you even more than you already were. By some bit of luck, we managed to get rid of my pursuant at the train platforms. We got into another car and sat at the doors that opened on the right side. A bit of a habit of mine, putting on my headphones and music, I took a look at the other people sitting on this new train. To my surprise, I could see my pursuer right there. Somehow, she had gotten on the train and sat only a few seats in front of me without me even noticing. It appeared she hadn't noticed me either. I prayed with everything I could so that she wouldn't see me. I have legendarily bad luck though. She noticed me as soon as I noticed her, and I saw the corners of her lips twitch with a smile. What really freaked me out was she was crying. I tried not to look at her the whole way, but I could feel her eyes boring into me. I was asking myself every question imaginable. What does this girl want from me? Why is she smiling at me like that? Why is she not even trying to talk to me? Maybe she's just creepy but shy. I finally arrived at my station and had the idea of rushing off when the doors were about to close. That's exactly what I did. I almost got crushed during this action. I turned around and saw the girl was now banging on the windows of the doors, screaming in anger. Her angry cries will remain in my mind forever. I wondered what the other users of the train thought at that moment. Now I was pretty reassured. I had finally gotten rid of this stranger. My date had went back to her own place a while ago. I was finally going to be able to go back to my own home. It was now 8pm though and I was starting to get pretty hungry. I stopped at the McDonald's next to the station. It was a Sunday evening so there were a good amount of people there. I left 20 minutes later having had a nice meal. Living with my parents since a difficult breakup previous. I was returning home to other people as well. Another detail at this time of year. A renovation was underway on the building where my parents and I resided, which meant a scaffolding was attached to the outside. I spent my time in the evenings in geek mode, playing games with friends. Since it was hot this night, I opened the blinds and the window about 30 centimeters to circulate some air inside. It was around 1am now. I turned everything off and put on my boxers to go to bed. At that very moment, I turned and noticed the girl's face peeking in through the openings of my blinds. Fortunately, the guardrail was preventing her from entering. I lived on the second floor, which meant she had climbed up the scaffolding to watch me for I don't know how long. At that moment, I grabbed my KSG-12 airsoft rifle from my cupboard. It looks very realistic to the untrained eye. I put a dummy cartridge in, where we'd normally put the pellets. I pointed it at the girl in fear. I told myself that she would leave after seeing this, but instead she started to cry. 
It's me, my love. Don't you recognize me? Let me in. My mother came into the room in a panic, and I ordered her to call the police, which she did right away. They came very quickly and arrested the young woman, who was screaming how much she loved me. Needless to say, I took a lot of pressure from the cops for my response. It was an airsoft rifle, but all the same. It was still understandable in this kind of situation to me, though. I couldn't sleep all night long. I bought a fan the next day and made sure my blinds and windows remained closed for a while. I went to the police to find out if I could file a complaint, too. I did it for attempted home invasion, aggravated variety. About a week later, I received a call from a psychiatrist giving me an appointment at a psych clinic in Paris. I went there on the indicated day. Arriving in the practitioner's office, he explained to me that he had my contact details. They were from the report of the complaint he'd received about the young woman. I learned why soon after. She was in this institute. Her ex-boyfriend had apparently cheated on her, and she completely lost her mind when she found out and stabbed him. According to the psychiatrist, I looked almost exactly like her ex. The doctor took me to the common room, and I saw the girl. We sat next to her, and the psychiatrist asked her if she knew me. She directly answered no, without a smile on her face, indifference personified. I admit that this actually kind of reassured me. The psychiatrist told me the complaint had been added to the girl's file, and it would extend her internment. I admit I felt a bit bad for her at that moment. I almost wanted to withdraw my complaint. For the safety of my parents and myself, though, I did not do so. Since then, I always sleep with my KSG-12 right next to my bed. I've had no further news since. It might be stupid of me to say, but I really do hope the girl gets better, only that she stays as far away from me as possible as well. I've had a lot of trouble getting to sleep since this event, but I haven't had any further psychological concerns. It sure is relieving to talk about, though. So it was a Thursday afternoon. At the time, I was in fourth grade, in a private Catholic college, although I suppose that's not that important a detail. This school was not very far from home, which was a residence with several neighbors around. On the day of this incident, we were studying. In the study, it was a bit of a mess. Everyone was talking, and we had been warned several times that if we continued being so loud, the supervisor would keep us until 5 p.m. instead of releasing us at 4.20. Because of a group of troublesome students in our class, we were of course kept until 5 p.m. Note that unlike me, almost all of the other people in my class went home by bus. I had to either take the town path or go down a slope that led to the residences, and this was an area where not many people passed by. That evening, as I often did, I took the slope because it was way faster. I put my music in my ears and started my walk. Everything was fine so far. I almost had a heart attack, though, when I suddenly felt someone grab my hand from behind. I turned my head, and to my surprise, I saw there was a little girl, about eight or nine years old. She had a school bag on her back. She looked just like any other normal little girl you'd see coming home from school. Except, she kept my hand in hers, and was walking as if nothing had happened, not saying a single word to me. I was already a bit perplexed, because I didn't know this girl at all. She squeezed my hand really hard, and seemed very tense. I was starting to have a very bad feeling. Even if it did seem a little weird to me, I told myself, maybe she's confusing me with someone else she knows. I was about to turn and ask her what she wanted and why she was holding on to me when I heard footsteps coming from right behind us. There was a male voice calling out to me. Instinctively, I turned around and saw a man who introduced himself in a rather polite manner. He told me he was the father of the little girl 
and he was sorry for any inconvenience she may have caused me. As naive as I can be, I didn't answer. I quickly realized a disturbing detail. These two did not look anything alike. Not hair color, not eye color, not facial structure, nothing at all. The little girl was black, had black hair and brown eyes, and this man was extremely pale-skinned, and his eyes and hair were very light colors, not a single feature matching, in short, the perfect opposite almost. I told myself that perhaps there were a thousand and one reasons why they wouldn't look alike. Genetics aren't exactly perfect, and it was also none of my business. I turned to the little girl to ask her more, but she looked completely paralyzed with fear. All I knew was that this girl clearly didn't like this guy. This girl is my little sister. Who are you? I almost regretted saying that the instant it left my mouth. After all, what if the guy really was her father? It would be super humiliating, and I might get in trouble. On the other hand, if it turned out he wasn't, it would be really bad for me to just let her go without doing anything. Without lying, that was the most intense moment of my entire life. I was so freaked out I even missed the code once before finally being able to enter my residence and slamming the door right in the guy's face. I took the little girl inside with me. He tried to extend his arm out to stop the door. We were already inside, so I didn't see if he did or not. I sprinted through the garden as I always did, but this time not to go home, but to go to a hall leading to a large building with other houses in it that I lived right next door to. The reason was fairly simple. I knew one of the people there living on the second floor. He was a police officer. He would be able to fight this guy if he came after us. I strongly thought that if he was not there at that moment, we were going to be in some serious trouble. Luckily, he was home. We called the police, and he waited for the man armed with his taser. After 20 minutes, though, the man still had not arrived. I guess the door had closed on him after all. I found out afterward that apparently this person was well known to the police for pedophilia and is now behind bars. Regarding the young girl... Apparently, she was unable to speak, which is why she didn't say a word to me. I can only imagine how scared she felt in that moment. I now take the city route home because it's more populated and less isolated. That's the end of my story, so I hope you liked it. My wife and I were coming home late from dinner and drinks at a friend's house. We were in the country outside of Union, Missouri, on the south side of Union. There was an antique bridge there that was quite scary to cross because it was so narrow and had a sharp turn at one end just after the bridge ended. The road went through a huge field, which at the time was under cultivation. I really had to go to the bathroom in the worst way because of all the beer I drank that night. My wife suggested I stop and go down to that field. There was an old shed right in the middle and you could squat down by the shed to use the bathroom. She stopped the car right in the road. Because it was late and so very dark, I got out and started to walk towards that shed, which was only a couple feet off the road. Suddenly, I saw something. It didn't register right away what I was looking at. It took me a couple of seconds to realize what it was. I saw two eyes, big glowing red eyes that were looking right at me from the darkness. I turned to see my wife looking over her shoulder at them too, confirming that I really was seeing this. It's kind of funny to think about now, but neither one of us said a single word. I just turned around and jumped right back in the car. We took off driving. My wife asked me what kind of animal I thought that was. I'm an old country boy, but I had never seen eyes shining like that before. The eyes were real big too, and high up, so it must have been a rare animal. I didn't know. The bridge has since been replaced with a new one, but that old shed is still there. 
Believe it or not, I still speed up whenever I go by it, because I'm still creeped out by whatever I saw that night all those years before. This happened last semester, when I was finishing the 10th grade. I'm a teenage girl with almost no enemies at all, which makes this story even weirder. I'm still a bit nervous to tell it, because of the person it involves. I just hope for the sake of my own life that it never gets back to them. This all began in my science class, on the very first day, when my teacher created the seating plan. Unfortunately, this was one of those teachers that didn't want you sitting with your friends. He believed this was a good way to get us to meet new people, but trust me when I say, there are some people you don't want to be meeting. My teacher sat me down next to a boy who I'd never seen before. His name was Al. Right away, I got some weird vibes from him, so I tried to focus on my worksheets and avoid conversation. Yes, I know that might sound a little bit rude, but it was a quiet class anyways. Not introducing yourself wasn't really out of the ordinary here. He seemed to be the type of person that didn't really have any social skills anyway, and seemed very awkward. He didn't appear to take very good care of himself either. Even though I was at least a foot or two away from him, I could smell his disgustingly bad breath. Apparently, I was not the only one who didn't want to introduce myself, because an awkward silence filled the entire room. My teacher noticed this, and stood up in front of the class. I know it may feel weird sitting beside a stranger, but it will feel a lot better if you get to know each other. I want you to turn to the person I seated you with, shake their hand, and tell them your name. Great. Now I had to talk to this guy. We introduced ourselves and shook hands. His hand was extremely sweaty, and the way he lingered during the handshake really creeped me out. Most people had brief conversations and then went back to their work immediately. That's what I was hoping for too, but of course that's not what happened. For about a minute things were quiet, but that entire time he was just staring at me. I looked over at him after a while because it was a bit strange how he was just non-stop staring. I wanted him to knock it off. Before I could ask what he was doing though, he started to talk to me again. What kind of music do you like? He asked awkwardly. I told him what I listened to honestly. Then I returned the question. I didn't want to be rude if he was making an earnest effort. He said in the most monotone and serious voice ever, I freaking love Nicki Minaj. I love everything about her. She's just the most beautiful woman ever. At first, I chuckled a bit. I thought maybe he was exaggerating or something, but then I realized he was being dead serious. I was surprised. He didn't really seem like the kind of guy that would like her music. Apparently, he had even been to quite a few of her concerts. Later on, though, he admitted to me that he didn't like her music at all. He just liked looking at her body. I didn't really care that much, and that wasn't the creepiest part anyway. He started telling me about his other classes. He focused a lot on his Spanish class. I asked him why he liked Spanish so much. He stared me directly in the eyes. Miss Johnson is the hottest teacher I've ever seen. I love her so freaking much. I didn't know how to answer that really. I just kind of said, oh, that's cool. I heard she's nice. He responded in the creepiest way imaginable. Yeah, she's real thick. I like him thick. Mmm. This was really weird. This guy did not seem like someone whose bad side I wanted to get on at all though. Yeah, there are pretty good teachers at this school, I guess. I didn't think there was anything wrong with how I responded. I definitely didn't expect the reaction I got from him. He had some weird outburst. No, I hate Mr. Jones. He's a piece of crap, he said angrily. I had no idea what I'd said that would provoke him like that. This wasn't even who we'd been talking about. He was also a teacher who was one of the most well-liked teachers in our school. I didn't know anyone that didn't like him. Apparently, he taught Al for English last semester, and clearly, things did not go very well. 
I didn't ask why he hated him so much. I figured it might just be best to play along in this situation before he caused even more of a scene. I just said, yeah, he's my drama teacher. He doesn't seem all that great. The kid talked to me the entire class. I barely even got to say a word back to him. I was just giving one-word answers for most of his questions, yet he would not stop talking to me. It was getting kind of annoying. He was intimidating, so I didn't really do anything about it, though. I wanted him to shut up so I could do my work. How was I going to finish this shit? As the days went by, I realized just how weird this guy was. He started to tell me about all of his problems, as if I was his therapist. He didn't say a single word to anyone else in the class. I think he knew I was the only one who wouldn't call him out for being such a weirdo, because I was scared of him. I had to sit next to him for the rest of the year. I dreaded science every single day, because I hated listening to him. I never got any work done, and he would tell me the most personal and disgusting things about himself. He even showed me the foot fungus on his toe. He pulled out his phone and showed me many pictures. I was so grossed out. I still didn't want to make him mad, though. A few days later, he brought up Mr. Jones again randomly, that teacher who he apparently hated. I'd never heard someone more angry in my entire life. He leaned in to whisper to me, You know, I've planned on killing him, right? I want him dead. I wasn't afraid to do it. The only thing stopping me was the law, but one day I'll find a way around that. He said it with a terrifying blank stare in the most serious way a person could speak. I was pretty concerned, frankly. All I said was, you don't want to risk going to jail, man. I really wanted to tell a teacher or a counselor because something was extremely off inside this guy's head. I had no doubt he would actually do it. The thing was, if he got in trouble for making threats like that, he would immediately know it was me who told on him. Who knows what he'd do to me then. I knew he'd start coming for me right away. It would be way easier for him to kill me than a teacher anyway. I told my friends about him instead. It turns out that one of my friends knew the guy. She said he was a complete nutcase and that if he made a threat like that again, I should tell someone immediately. She agreed he wasn't even slightly joking when he said that. For the rest of the semester, he would ask me creepy questions and randomly swear under his breath. One time he asked me what my stripper name would be if I was a stripper. Just creepy random things about that. At one point he even asked me if I was genuinely afraid of him. He really wanted me to like him. I was so afraid of being on his bad side. He had shown himself to be very violent and talked about revenge a lot. He had a very unpredictable short fuse too. One day we had to be lab partners and for the lab we were going to need a source of gas. I turned on the gas so we could use it. He started swearing and yelling at me, calling me stupid and saying I was wasting the gas. I told him I was sorry and asked if he wanted to be in charge instead. I didn't want the teacher to think I was the one causing problems. There was another incident where we were learning about the carbon cycle and how cows contributed to it. The teacher was trying to be funny and said something like, Whenever I drive past a farm, I always make sure to plug my nose so I don't smell the cow poop. Out of nowhere, he just loudly blurted out, I inhale deeply. The rest of the class burst out laughing. I knew he was probably serious though. He didn't laugh at all because he was definitely being dead serious. For the next hour of our class, he told everyone about his poop fetish over and over. You have no idea how hard it was to keep a straight face while he was telling me that there was nothing he loved more than the smell of it. He even said he ate horse dung one time. It was all extremely hard to listen to. It began to get unbearable when he started to go into his personal habits as well. He said he liked playing with his own feces and how he would purposely touch other people's stuff after because it turned him on, knowing other people came into contact with it. After an hour of listening to him talk about this, I was getting really annoyed. I started being a little bit rude and sarcastic. I soon realized that was a big mistake though. He became really angry at me and started screaming. My classmates were now staring at me. I tried to calm him down before he made an even bigger scene. 
I lied and said I wasn't making fun of him. I actually thought it was a real cool thing. It took three whole minutes of apologizing and convincing before he finally calmed down. He started to get even creepier. He walked into class late one day and extremely pissed off after the teacher's lesson was over. He started ranting to me like a maniac. I hate everyone in this stupid fucking school. I should come here with a gun and just blast everyone down, then take myself out after. I don't even care anymore. He said this with a piercing eye, staring directly at me. I was scared. Nobody in their right mind would say that to someone they barely know. I wanted to tell someone so badly, but I couldn't prove what he'd said. I didn't tell anyone except a few close friends. I tried to convince him otherwise that hurting anyone in our school would be a horrible idea, but that just resulted in him getting mad at me. I worried that if one more teacher made him mad, he really would act on his threat. He definitely fit the profile of a scared we sure socially awkward loner, lack of compassion, poor judgment, not caring about the consequences of his actions. Every day I worried he might do it at any moment. Luckily, it's now summertime, and I'm out of school for a while, so I don't have to see that psycho again until September. I'm glad he didn't hurt anyone, though. He did harass and scare people in other ways. There are too many incidents to remember. I'll name a few just to be quick. That Spanish teacher who I mentioned earlier who he was showing interest in? Obviously, she was annoyed by his behavior in her class. I wasn't there to see it happen but apparently he made some inappropriate comments to her during Spanish. She found out he was planning on taking her other class as well. I was told he was banned from taking classes with her. I can only assume she didn't allow him to take them because of his creepy behavior. Another time, he called over the class peer tutor who was male and one year older than us. He asked for help on a question but was not able to understand even after the tutor explained, so he got very angry at him. He threatened that if he brought his white ass anywhere near him again, he'd kill him. I found out a few days later. He'd called the peer tutor over and over again. I thought maybe he would try to apologize, but no. He looked him dead in the face and said he was going to off him. The peer tutor was really creeped out. Luckily, he just laughed and then left. Al stared at me like I was messing with him. He's the creepiest person I've ever met. Now you know how I unwittingly became the therapist of some weird psychopath who might attack our school one day. I just hope I don't have any classes with him ever again because I don't think I could handle it. I really hope he gets some help. A friend of mine told me the story of a girl she had met from Sweden who stayed with her for a while. The girl was in her mid-twenties, and we'll call her Jane. Jane was driving to her mother's house one late evening. She lived far away from the city in a heavily forested area. There weren't really any streetlights on this road because of this, and not a lot of houses either. The few houses that were built were back into the forest, and had long winding driveways so you couldn't really see them from the road. As she was driving along this road, something up ahead caught her eye. There appeared to be a small bundle on the side of the road. As her car passed by this bundle, she was shocked to see what looked like a baby wrapped up in a blanket just laying there. Jane slammed the brakes, stopping about 50 meters up the road. She reversed and jumped out of the car as quick as she could, thinking that someone had just abandoned their baby on the roadside. Jane ran over to the bundled up blanket and exhaled a sigh of relief when she realized it was just a toy. Just as she made to pick it up though, she saw headlights coming down the road in front of her. She suddenly realized that she was standing on the road alone at night, in the middle of nowhere basically. She quickly ran back to her car and jumped in, then started the engine and drove off. The car behind her sped up, coming really close to the back of her car. It was honking its horn at her over and over. Jane was now panicking. She started driving faster and faster, constantly checking her rearview mirror, 
Although she couldn't see who was in the car behind her, she was still terrified. Eventually, she reached her mother's driveway, which was still about two miles long. Her mother lived deep into the forest. She thought to herself that if the car followed her down the driveway, she would call her mother and tell her to ring the police immediately. As you might imagine, as she turned into the driveway, the car continued to follow behind her, still very close. She kept thinking back to that baby toy and how creepy the evening had been. Jane got out her phone and called her mother. She told her that she was being followed and to call the police right now. She was expected to arrive in about five minutes. Both cars were going way too fast for that tiny, narrow dirt road. There were no street lights at all either. All that Jane could see was what was being lit up by her headlights and the headlights of her pursuer. She began to see her mother's house in the distance. The car behind her was still extremely close, blaring their horn so loudly that Jane's ears began to ring. As she got to the house, she jumped out of the car. Her mother was already standing at the front door, waiting for her with a kitchen knife in hand. The car that was following her also stopped, and the car's doors flew open. An elderly couple got out of the car and started shouting and pointing at Jane's vehicle. Someone's in your car, they screamed. That's when Jane realized what really happened. The man inside jumped out of the back seat, now having been discovered, and ran off into the forest. Everyone just looked at each other in shock. The car that was coming down the road just happened to see someone jump into her vehicle when she'd stopped to check on the baby. It was likely the man had left it there on the road on purpose and was waiting for people to stop and take advantage of their kindness. As I said at the start of the story, a friend of mine told this to me secondhand. I believed it to be true, though. If anyone else has heard of this, please leave a comment down below. Always remember to lock your doors whenever you leave your vehicle. You never know what you might need to be prepared for. This happened to my sister about 15 years ago, when she was still in high school and I was in middle school. Our mom worked as a house cleaner and always became friends with the people whose homes she cleaned. One of those homes was owned by an elderly couple who had no kids but had a huge house with a really nice pool. They would always invite me and my siblings to come over swimming and have fun. The husband worked as a CEO of a large airline company, and they lived in a very nice neighborhood on a large lot surrounded by forests. When you were in their backyard, you couldn't see the other houses at all. Just trees all around. It felt very secluded. Their house was very angular and architecturally interesting, with multiple levels made from stone. Pretty much every room had these big floor-to-ceiling windows that looked out over the backyard and gave great views of the landscape during the day. At night, however, the reflection from the inside lights prevented you from seeing out. It was always a bit unnerving to walk by them, since you couldn't really see what was on the outside. The couple also liked to decorate with old Native American art and masks, which was a little bit creepy to a middle schooler. The couple themselves were very nice and not creepy at all, though, so I never got really scared when I was over there. They had an older golden retriever named Samson that lived up to his name. He was massive but had a sweet and gentle temperament. They'd also rescued a husky mix named Sadie, who was the polar opposite. Psycho Sadie, as we lovingly called her. She had intense separation anxiety, and she would destroy their home whenever they left. She would also jump their short fence and go wild if they let her outside. If they took her with them to run errands, she would destroy their car while they were inside the store. She would howl non-stop until they returned. Since they were wealthy and had the extra money to do so, they would pay me and my sister to come over and dog-sit for them. While they went out, we got 20 bucks an hour. 
so we were always excited to go over there, watch Cable swim in their awesome pool. Normally, everything would be fine. Both dogs would usually just kind of lay around and do nothing. Occasionally, Sadie would realize I was a stranger and go nuts and start barking at me. I would literally watch her eyes turn red. I was almost convinced she was going to attack me. She would always calm down, though, after I got up on the couch. I digress. This particular incident happened over Easter weekend, while the homeowners were out of town for two days. They were paying my sister to stay over there that weekend. I was going to be staying with her the first night, because it was a big house and it was kind of scary to stay there all alone. We stayed up late watching movies and eating junk food. The next day, we swam in their pool and hung out, but for some reason, I decided not to spend the night again. I'm kind of glad I didn't because what happened that night scarred my sister for life. It all started when my sister was working out on their treadmill in their workout room. Their workout room was on the bottom floor of their home, which was a walkout basement. Just outside the room was a huge glass door that opened right to their patio and pool. She had the TV on in the workout room as she was running and was watching the TV when she thought she heard the house alarm beep like it did whenever the door was opened. She stopped on the treadmill and went to look around. She saw that the sliding glass door was opened. Now, this door was huge. There's no way it would have opened by itself. Instantly, she freaked out. However, the dogs were just lying there. She figured that if someone really had intruded, they would have gotten up to investigate. Especially because Sadie could get so crazy and hated strangers so much. She thought she might have just accidentally left the door open and just imagined the beep of the alarm. Maybe it could have come from the TV or the treadmill itself. She closed and locked the door and went back to working out. A couple of minutes later, though, she started to get the distinct feeling of someone watching her. She looked around, but no one seemed to be there. She finished her workout, but she couldn't shake that feeling of being watched. She decided to just go to bed, as she was becoming extremely creeped out. She wanted to try and forget about this feeling. She went around and made sure all the doors were locked. The owners didn't give her the alarm code, so she couldn't set it herself. She took a shower and locked herself in the guest bedroom with both dogs, just in case. Eventually, she fell asleep. A couple of hours later, though, she awoke to both dogs now growling at the door of the room. It was fairly normal for Psycho Sadie to growl and bark for no reason, but Samson had never shown such overt signs of aggression. Immediately, my sister knew something was wrong. She was shaking, trying to convince herself the dogs had just heard an animal and that it was all nothing. Then, though, she heard the dreadful door alarm beeping. She called my dad in a panic, crying and screaming. He told her to hang up and call the police, as he was on his way over right now. She called the cops, and my dad made the 15-minute drive in just under five minutes. When she opened the bedroom door to let my dad inside the house, the dogs took off running and barking down to the basement. My sister ran screaming all the way through the house to the front door to let my dad in. He quickly took a look around with his gun, but he didn't see anything unusual. The police arrived a few minutes later and looked around the property. They found that the back gate was open, as well as the sliding glass door again. Not enough to let the dogs out, though. Just barely ajar, like someone had slammed it shut and it had bounced back open. They said it looked like someone had entered the home through that area because the lock had been tampered with. They determined that whoever this was had not stolen or disturbed anything. When my dad asked why someone would break in and not do anything, especially with the dogs locked up, the police said they had been notified by the homeowners earlier that month that the husband had received death threats because of a decision he made on the job. Apparently, it put a lot of people out of work. 
They had gone to the police about it, but didn't bother to tell my sister to keep an eye out for anything suspicious, since they didn't think anything would really happen. Needless to say, we never dog sat for them again, and they moved out of state within a few months because the husband lost his job. If you ask me, he kind of deserved it. I remember the apartment being very cold when we walked in. It was probably in the low 60s outside, but it somehow felt even colder in our one-bedroom domicile than it did in the drafty courtyard. I mentioned it to Ben, but he didn't even respond. He already had the game on and was complaining about the luck of the football team from some city across the country that he would never even go to. I decided I was going to warm up in the shower. I put the statement out there, 60% as a notification and 40% as an offer for Ben to join me. He responded with a sound that I'm not even sure qualifies as a grunt. I went on my own and let the shower warm up. Then I slipped in. I felt the grime of the workday, the after-work drinks we had to have with Ben's boss, and the chill of the night wash off me as soon as the stream of water hit my body. And the first couple of minutes in the shower were utter bliss to me, one of those moments when you feel like nothing in life could ever be better. I never wanted to get out. Then though, I heard what sounded like someone peeing on the other side of the shower curtain. Ben, I said in a thoroughly annoyed tone, please don't flush the toilet. I heard the urine stop. I didn't hear the toilet flush. I heard Ben walk out of the bathroom. I showered for another 10 minutes before I got out, dried off, and headed back to the bedroom. I glanced over at Ben still on the couch, glued to the same game. I heard him muttering something about a fumble or some sort of sports thing. Thanks for not flushing the toilet, I said before ducking into our bedroom. I didn't go into the bathroom, Ben said. I stopped in the doorway and then walked back into the living room. Don't lie, I heard you peeing when I was in the shower. Ben threw his hands up with his eyes still on the game. I haven't gotten up from my seat since we walked in. It's overtime, Ben insisted. His tone was the kind where I could tell he was telling the truth about something. The warmth of the hot shower now slithered off me in a second. Don't mess with me, I stated coldly to Ben. I swear, I didn't go in there. I started to get an ominous feeling. I didn't know what to do. I stood there, shivering in nothing but a towel. Ben rose to his feet and walked towards me. I watched his eyes scan the room with a fear in them I had never seen before. He stopped in the doorway and grabbed me, covered my mouth, and perked his ears out. I didn't hear anything, though, other than the ominous ring of a siren. We stood there for a few more moments. I heard nothing. The siren was also gone. Well, we would have heard something if someone was in here, Ben said. He reluctantly agreed to search the apartment anyway. We searched the place up and down and didn't find anything out of the usual. Finding nothing was actually worse though than finding a junkie with a bloody knife or some hideous monster under my bed or something. The mystery of the whole thing was worse than any nightmare I could have imagined. The next few weeks were pretty tense. I didn't want to stay in the apartment alone. Ben told me my brain must have just played a trick on me. It was just a bad thought, he said. There was no possible way someone could have been in there. It was not a good idea on his part to tell me that. I lost trust in him. What happened was definitely not in my head. I knew it. I got my confirmation a few weeks later, when I stood in the shower getting ready for work. I was almost done with the shower when I heard a flush whirring from the other side of the shower curtain. I couldn't dodge the water in time and took a stinging hot stream to the face. I screamed and opened the shower curtain. No one was there. I heard footsteps walking away from the open bathroom door though. I heard the front door unlock and then close again. I called out, my body cold despite the hot water pounding on my back. There was no answer. I covered up in a towel and walked into the bedroom. There was no sign of Ben around either. 
I checked out the living room where there was a handwritten note on the coffee table. I had to go to work early today, babe. Sorry. I called him up. He was clearly annoyed that I was calling him at work, yet he confirmed that he had not been there to flush the toilet when I was in the shower. He'd left far before I even got in. I listened to the space around me in the apartment. I didn't even know what Ben said after that point. Everything felt like it had fallen silent, but it felt like the entire apartment was alive around me. At that point, I ended the call with Ben. One thing was clear. Whoever had been sneaking around the bathroom while I was showering had some way to get in and out of our apartment. Either that or Ben was a severely fucked up guy and wanted to deeply disturb me for some reason, but I didn't think that was right. Ben continued to swear up and down that it was not him doing this. He brought up the idea of me inventing the whole thing in my head again. I offered a solution. What if we set up some cameras inside the apartment? I wanted to record the entire premises. Ben didn't want to spend that much money, so we settled on simply recording the front door and the bathroom. I reviewed the tapes each day at work. Weeks went by without so much as a hint of anyone doing anything at any moment of the day, let alone when I was in the shower. All I could see was Ben and I going about our daily lives, barely talking to each other, going back and forth to work. The fear that all of this was in fact in my head started to really bubble up. I felt some tension from Ben whenever he asked me about every other day if I had seen anything on the cameras yet. Our already strained relationship felt like it was hanging on by a single thread. We were barely talking now. It all came to a head when I reviewed the footage about a month after I set up the cameras. The footage from the bathroom proved fruitful finally. It was footage of while I was in the shower. I stopped the footage once I saw a shadow appear in the screen of the bathroom window. I stopped breathing as I watched the shadowy figure pull away the screen from the window, then slide into the room. The light wasn't very good in the bathroom. With me taking the shower after my nightly workout just around dusk, I hadn't turned on the bathroom light. However, I could see what looked to be a stout man in black pants, a hoodie, and wearing a white mask, standing in the bathroom right next to me as I was taking a shower. I couldn't believe it. I had always showered with the curtain closed at that point in time, and I hadn't seen the man through them. I hated myself almost as much as I was scared. As I watched the footage, those feelings burned in me as I watched the man just stand there watching me for a few seconds before heading over to the toilet. I heard the sound of the shower stopping on the video. I knew I would open the curtain at any second, and I wondered how in the hell I hadn't caught this man. What I watched next literally made me vomit a little bubble in the back of my throat. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The man reached down and stuck his fingers against the floor of our bathroom and yanked against the tiles. I watched as about half of the bathroom floor practically rose up about a foot off the ground with him holding it. The man slipped into the dark opening underneath. He seemed to disappear into the floor altogether before slowly easing the tiles back into the ground right when I opened the shower curtain. I watched myself get out of the shower, grab a towel, and head to the bedroom in real time. I fast-forwarded through the rest of the video until it ran out. The guy had never come out of that floor space, meaning he had been in there the entire night until I left for work the next day. Hell, he could still be in the apartment right now. One burning thought simmered in my mind when the realization washed over me. It was the day before Veterans Day, and Ben had the day off while I didn't. He was still at home, with that man possibly in the bathroom floor hiding. I scrambled to call Ben as soon as I could, but there was no answer. I called over and over, but there was no answer no matter how many times I tried. I called the cops and drove back home, without telling my boss anything. The cops were already there when I arrived. They busted down the door and found the apartment entirely empty. There was no one in that hollowed-out section beneath the bathroom floor. Ben's cell phone was in the bedroom, but he was nowhere to be found. 
As the police searched outside, they found spikes stuck in the side of the building, which led all the way up from the alley behind our building to our third floor bathroom window. They looked to be the sort of spikes a mountain climber would use to climb a cliff or something. They believed he must have lived in one of the other tall apartment complexes nearby and had been spying on me. They believe he used the spikes to break in during the day over and over while the two of us were out at work and cut that hole in our bathroom floor, then dug out an area to create a hiding space a little bigger than himself where he could hide away when needed. They said he seemed to be incredibly skilled at what he did. Likely he had been doing it to apartments all around the area if he was doing this much. The story of Ben was far more disturbing. The police found his car parked on a sidewalk a few blocks away, in its usual spot. His cell phone was right where he usually left it too, but he had vanished without a trace. I've since moved out of the apartment. Ben was never found. I moved a few cities over back to my parents' home to try and throw the scent off of whoever was doing this. The limited clues and leads the police possess have been shared over the past few months, but none of them seem to lead anywhere. All they have to go by is that they don't think that Ben had anything to do with the sneak-ins himself, and that him and the masked assailant were unrelated. They don't know what to think about his disappearance. My cousins live in North Dakota, and I spent winter break at their place freshman year in college. We were at their friend's house one night, drinking in her basement with some other girls. It was getting really late, about 3 a.m. or so. I was falling asleep, so I decided to walk home. They live in a desolate area with lots of snow, and it gets really cold, especially at night. The houses weren't too far apart though, and when the moon is out, it seems to light the outside path very well. The path we take is straight behind the house through some wooded areas, then some more open land. As I was shuffling home through the snow, with my head hung down low, I looked up to the left of my 10 o'clock. Probably around 75 yards away, I could see another figure walking in the opposite direction. I saw him a split second before he saw me. When he did, he kind of did an unnatural jerking motion in his arms and shoulders, obviously startled at the sight of me. I laughed out loud for some reason, maybe just the shock of seeing this or something. I gave him a little wave and said, Oh, he has startled me. You know, that kind of thing. The person just stood there, though, and started staring at me. I thought he was going to say something for a second, and so I stopped for a moment, just looking back at him. I could see he had a full-face ski mask on, and I could tell it was obviously a man. He was really tall. He didn't say anything, so it felt like forever. It was just me and this stranger in a ski mask looking at each other in the desolate woods in the middle of winter at 3 a.m a huge chill went down my spine and a voice in the back of my head told me i needed to get the hell out of there right now i turned and started walking as fast as i could the other direction i've never been that scared in my life i was drunk and stoned and very paranoid i imagined me walking home from the opposite perspective the man running up behind me with an axe and gutting me. I started sprinting as fast as I could, all the way back home, thinking this guy could easily follow my tracks in the snow, and I was probably going to die tonight. Luckily, that didn't happen, but I don't think I'll be visiting that area again anytime soon. I'm a 30-year-old transgender male. For the sake of my demeanor when this event occurred, I was a 19-year-old timid lesbian headed into the world immediately after graduation. I had just lost my job at McDonald's due to a massive flood taking out a lot of businesses in my area. I had a girlfriend that lived 30 minutes away, and I needed gas money to get to her, 
so I took a job offered to me by a family friend at a 24-7 gas station in the next town over from mine. The shift I was hired for was 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. I had never worked a night shift in my life, but I thought it would be pretty cool to have little to no pressure other than to make sure the coffee was ready at 4 a.m. for the morning regulars. I was required to train on day shift for the first couple of weeks to get accustomed to the usual operations. Throughout those weeks, I learned many of the ins and outs of what takes place on the night shift. I also learned the ins and outs of the people that hung around these places for hours, and there were quite a few of them. One woman in particular, Melinda, would come in every morning before and after dropping her kids at school, around lunchtime sometimes, actually buying us lunch. In the evening when her husband was home too. She came for hours, considering she lived a couple of streets over. She was very nice, and I started to enjoy her visits. We all got along so well at that store. It was a really fun atmosphere for the most part. It was finally time for me to start working the night shift, though. I had my manager with me for a few nights. I was taking her place on night shift because she couldn't do it anymore. I thought she was nice, and I admit I did have a pretty big crush on her as well, so I didn't mind spending the time with her all night. I learned that when she worked the night shift, Melinda would spend the entire night there. I had been working the night shift alone for a couple of weeks at this point, and some of those night shift drug on into the days when we were short-staffed. Again, I really needed the money, though. One night, I was doing my chores, scrubbing the hot dog rollers, setting the coffee filters up for the rush, and mopping the entire store. While emptying my mop bucket, I heard the chime on the door. I looked at my watch and saw it was around 2 a.m., I was on. There wasn't typically anyone coming into the store until 4 o'clock consistently. I was a little upset because I had just mopped the floor. I went out to see who it was. Just as I headed out, the movement in the mirror overhead to stop shoplifters caught my eye. There was a man at the counter doing something with the money order machine. Upon looking closer, he had a knife on him. He seemed to be cutting all the wires. For what reason, I have no clue. While he was cutting, I heard him muttering, Where's Bonka? Over and over again. I knew I could walk back and get to the phone in the office, but I didn't want him to hear me moving. I pulled my personal cell out and texted Melinda to call the cops. I tried to text quickly as much of the situation as I could describe. She told me she would be right down there. I was freaking out with every second that passed by. Before she could get there, the man stormed outside to the gas pumps. He began throwing the trash cans everywhere and started to try and cut through the gas lines with his knife. I took the opportunity to lock the front door, just in case he tried to get back in. Thank God I did, because as soon as he noticed me, he immediately made a beeline to the door and started jabbing his knife into it. Just as he did, the cops and Melinda showed up. He was arrested and put into the cop car, while I explained everything that had just happened. Turns out Bonka was the name of my manager, whose name was Bianca. Apparently, this guy had become obsessed with her in the weeks prior, dropping in nightly and making her very uncomfortable, which explains why she wanted to replace me with the night shift. They knowingly threw me into this mess, and seeing me there instead of her was what turned his obsession into rage. The man became extremely unhinged that he could no longer see Bianca, and decided to try and take that out in the gas station, and I guess me as well. This happened to me a couple of years ago. At the time, my fiancé didn't even believe me, but I'd been convinced for several weeks that someone was watching our home. Several Amazon packages had been stolen. We'd find cigarette butts by the front door when neither of us smoke, and the doormat had been moved as well. We had just moved to the area recently, and I was feeling really uneasy about all of this. 
My fiancé teased me for watching too many murder mysteries and crime shows, and eventually I dropped the subject altogether. One night, we were in bed together nearly asleep when our cat started being really loud. My fiancé got up to feed her when he realized we forgot to get cat food when we were out earlier. We both felt a little guilty about going to sleep knowing she was hungry, so he told me not to worry. He would run over to the little 24-hour convenience store that was about five minutes down the street. He got dressed to leave and I rolled over to go back to bed. I'm lying on my side in bed facing our window, and right as my fiancé goes to leave, I can see his shadow on the blinds as he walks down the sidewalk. I didn't know it yet, but apparently he forgot to lock the door. Maybe a minute or two after he left, I saw a shadow pass by the bedroom window again and heard footsteps coming back up the sidewalk. I figured since he was tired, he'd probably forgotten his wallet or something and had to come back. This wouldn't be the first time such a thing had happened. I chuckled to myself at how forgetful he is, and the front door opened. My cat jumped off the bed to go and greet him. What happened next took place over the span of maybe three minutes or so, but it felt like three days in the moment. It was dark and dead quiet in our house. Quiet enough, I could hear my cat's little steps on the bedroom carpet, suddenly stopping. She then let out the deepest and most terrifying growl I'd ever heard a cat make. At this point, I heard whoever this was take a few steps into our living room, shush her, and then sneeze. It was definitely not my fiancé's voice. There I was, a woman alone at night and naked in bed, scared out of my mind with no idea what to do. This guy clearly knew my fiancé was out. Did he know I was home alone? Was he there to kidnap or hurt me? My phone had died earlier, of course, so now it was off and plugged into the charger. I knew that once I turned it on, AT&T's loud-as-fuck little jingle was going to betray me, so for right now, I was on my own. Thankfully, we keep a shotgun by our bedside. I slipped out of bed, grabbed the gun, and crawled as quietly as I could toward the bedroom door, which was two-thirds of the way closed. I could hear this creep rummaging through our stuff in the living room. He was sneezing over and over. The nerve of this prick. I peeked through the gap in the door, and the outside light was just barely bright enough to illuminate a man hunched over our entertainment center, his back towards me. I silently opened the door the rest of the way and stood still, still 100% naked and 100% determined to keep myself and my cat safe. I muttered all my stupidity and courage and cocked my gun. In the deepest booming voice my body would allow me to make, I bellowed out, What the fuck do you think you're doing? I've never seen a human jump so hard or run so fast. I scared the creep so badly it looked like he was about to launch himself into orbit. I got one good look at his back as he ran outside into the darkness. Then he was gone. I slammed the door shut behind him and yanked my terrified cat out from underneath the couch by their neck. We booked it back to the bedroom with my gun still in hand. I held her close to my chest and started sobbing while I struggled to turn my phone on and dial 911. My fiancé got home with a can of cat food moments later and immediately noticed the PS4 on the ground and our other electronics moved around. He found me in the bedroom flipping out. I barely got any words out to explain what happened before the cops showed up too. They were super nice, but unfortunately there was not much they could do. They didn't exactly have a lot to go on, since neither of us had seen the man's face at all, and therefore we couldn't give them a description really. Fortunately, none of our stuff actually ended up being taken, and more importantly, my cat and I were both okay. We were positive, though, that the creep must have lived in our area, as a few weeks later, someone we knew just up the street was robbed in the exact same way left his door unlocked for a moment to run to the store, came back and everything had been stolen. I'm not sure if they ever caught the guy. We noped out of that neighborhood pretty quick after. 
Lock your doors, people. A few years ago, I had a dog-sitting business with regular clients. One of those regular clients was a lady with a big, nice house. It was a really long driveway leading up to the house, and it was tucked far back from the residential roads. It was somehow isolated while being in a dark residential neighborhood. No one could drive to the house without being noticed. No one could park on the adjacent streets either, and it would be very unusual for anyone to be walking up to the house or through the yard without already having parked in the driveway. The last time my house slash dog sat there, everything began as usual. I fed the dogs, gave them their various meds, and played with them for a while while watching movies. It was basically the best job ever. Eventually, I got sleepy and went to bed in the master bedroom, as per orders. This room had a huge, beautiful window with a view of the driveway, the only normal access point to the home. I liked that about this room. After browsing on my phone in bed, I turned everything off and was trying to get some sleep. As I was lying there staring at the ceiling, deep in thought, I was suddenly snapped to total awareness. Nothing changed and no one came up the driveway either. Everything seemed to be completely silent and still, and yet suddenly I started to feel very uneasy. My hair started to stand up on the back of my neck, and a voice in my head was shouting urgently, you're being watched. Someone is watching you. My heart rate began to pick up. I'd never experienced anything like this, and I can't really explain it in the least. I called my boyfriend immediately, grabbed my stuff, ran to my car, locked the doors, and sped out of the driveway. I glanced around the house as I was leaving, and still did not see anything. When I got home, I checked every door to make sure it was locked and slept on the couch with a view of both entry points. The paranoia slowly dissipated, and eventually I was able to sleep just fine. The next day, I returned in the morning and took care of the dogs. Loves, meds, potty, breakfast. I started walking through the house towards the back, where the master bedroom is. Again, I started to feel really strange. It was not a feeling of being watched this time but more of a high alert sense that things were off subtly. I began to notice that there were candy wrappers on the ground that weren't there the night before. Doors were open that I'd specifically closed to keep the dogs corralled. Things had been subtly moved around. I left again and called my boyfriend to stay with me. I could not be in this house alone. There had absolutely been someone in there the night prior. I wondered if maybe someone in the family stopped by, but every time previously they'd always given me lots of warning before someone came over. It was not too uncommon for the owner's son to stop by, but he had my number and he also gave me a heads up whenever he was coming. I called up the owner just to make sure and told her what I'd noticed. She told me she'd call around and see if anyone had stopped by. She called me back in under an hour and assured me that no one did. Must be that old ghost, she said and gave a mischievous giggle. Wow, what a relief she was taking my safety concerns so seriously. I told her I was having my boyfriend come over just to be safe. Thankfully, she didn't mind. A few hours later, me and my boyfriend get back to the house. He checks the downstairs. Absolutely never was I to go upstairs. Everything was fine. We were hanging out for hours, playing with the dogs and watching movies. I left my boyfriend in the living room, walked past the front door, and went to the bathroom at around 10 p.m. I'm about to walk back out when suddenly the dogs start barking. As I'm walking back, I see my boyfriend standing in the entryway by the living room. He was focused on the front door, and tense like I'd never seen him. Again, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. He ducked to the side of the front door window. Before I could even finish asking what was going on, he shushed me. Someone's out there! He approached the door and looked out. But whoever it was was no longer in sight. 
I rushed over to him, and he explained that as he was sitting on the floor in the living room, the dog started barking at the front door. When he went over to check, he saw a black figure peering in through the windows, then walked off. When I looked out, no one was there anymore. I'm absolutely terrified at this point, so I texted the son again to make sure it was not him. Short aside, a few weeks prior he'd asked me to go to a wedding with him, and I gently replied that my boyfriend didn't think it was appropriate. So when I asked him if he'd stop by the house, he replied, My girlfriend doesn't think it's appropriate you're texting me so late. I apologized and told him I had a safety concern and it was quite important. I told him what my boyfriend saw. He responded that he did not stop by. At that point, we were done for the night. We put the dogs in their kennels, waited a bit, and ran to my car. The next day, I very quickly took care of the dogs in the morning and left before the owner got back. I never felt such a deep electric sense of imminent danger like I did that first night in bed. It was just too much. When the owner asked me back a few months later, even though I desperately needed the money, I declined right away. I had an encounter in December of last year that left me feeling very unsettled. I was in a vulnerable position as my partner and I were both female and homeless. We had just purchased an RV to live in, but were having trouble finding a spot to rent. It was an older model and we have pets as well. We parked in the farthest corner of the Walmart parking lot in Bend, Oregon around 10 a.m. one day. My partner had some errands that needed to be run and took a bus to do them. I held down the Ford and watched the dogs while they were away. It was going to be a long day of waiting around for her to get back so we could leave. I went into the store twice to make some purchases early in the day. I worked on some maintenance and art before getting bored enough to take a nap. As I was taking the dogs outside beforehand, two police officer vehicles pulled up and parked right next to the RV. At this point, I was preparing for them to ask me to move the vehicle or tell me I can't park overnight or something. After a while of nothing, though, I fell asleep anyway. When I woke up, I could tell it was getting toward the evening. The sun was still very much up, though, and considering the police presence, I wasn't particularly in the mindset of anything bad happening. Still, I always carry my pepper spray on me. My partner was not back yet, although I was expecting her to be back late. She had our only phone, so I went into the store to check the time. The officers had moved away by this point, and the parking area in general was pretty barren, save for one van parked in the spot right behind the RV. I entered the store and went to the restroom in the front. I walked over to the electronics department to see what time it was on the displays. It was a few minutes before 6 p.m. I left after only having been in there a few minutes. As I was walking out the door, the crowd in front of me slowly dispersed to veer toward their respective vehicles. I continued walking behind one man who seemingly parked in the same direction as me. He was tall, thin, and scraggly, with shoulder-length blonde hair and a black hoodie. I walked maybe 30 feet behind him the whole way. As he passed all the cars by the front of the store, I came to the conclusion that this man must be the owner of the vehicle behind the RV. He walked with clear direction, not looking around for where his car was or anything. After passing the main crowd of the parking lot, I got my pepper spray out of my pocket and held it in my hand, just as a routine safety measure. The man walked between the back of the RV and the driver's side door of the van. I figured he was about to get in, but instead he just kinda lingered there. I stopped walking that direction and headed toward a more populated parking area at the next store across the street. It was closer than Walmart from this end. He looked at me and we made eye contact for a while. It felt like he recognized me, as if he'd been staking me out and was surprised to see me leaving the store so soon. I continued to walk away while staring at him, 
and he watched me before slipping around the side of my RV, where there were some bushes and a fence with no outlet. I'm noping the fuck out at this point, so I went into another store and walked around, blankly staring at things for a bit, trying to formulate my next plan. It was pretty busy in there with no one at the customer service desk, so I went into the gas station next door and asked to use the phone. I called my partner to explain the situation and told her not to go directly to the RV when she got back. I then headed back into Walmart, got a coffee at the McDonald's inside, and waited there for an hour until she was able to return. Perhaps I should have called the police, as I was worried about my animals and my possessions being stolen, but I had recently called 911 while witnessing domestic violence a few days prior. They took two hours to show up even though it was in the middle of downtown, and when they did, they harassed me for being homeless anyway. I was worried they'd not only not help, but I might possibly get in trouble for even being there. I don't have a driver's license myself, so having to move the RV before my partner returned would be a dangerous situation. When she arrived, we went back to the RV together. The van was gone. Nothing was touched despite one of the windows not locking properly, but the pets were very spooked. Maybe they decided against doing anything after I'd caught them. I'm not that well off though, obviously, and honestly, one look at that beat up old thing would tell you I don't have much worth taking. Honestly, just from the look in that guy's eyes, I feel like he wasn't there for my material possessions. Happily, I'll never have to find out for sure. I was 21 and recently became a police officer. I was also recently dumped, so my friend suggested Tinder. As a 21-year-old and new cop, I had that I'm invincible and can take on anyone mentality. I matched with a very good-looking out-of-my-league woman. We chatted and eventually set up a date to meet. She said she had a great open field to look at stars and hang out and we could meet up at her house. So the night came and I was excited. She seemed excited too when I picked her up. She guided me to the field and it looked very nice. Open space, woods, deer, and other wildlife. In the field, I noticed these really dim headlights in the distance. Then a van started driving towards us. They pulled up in front of us, almost close enough to block me from going forward. I told her to stay in the car, and I'd go say hi. I grabbed my flashlight and walked up. In the driver's side of the van, there was a decently sized man. I asked him what was going on, and if he could back up his car a little bit. He was very polite, and said he was the owner of the property, and that he didn't mean to scare us. He told me he'd been having some trouble with poachers on his property, and wanted to make sure we weren't going to be shooting at anything. I ensured him we'd only come out to look at some stars and wildlife. He was perfectly okay with that, and told me to have a nice date, then drove away. After that, the girl was texting non-stop. Around an hour later, I saw headlights coming towards us again, this time at a really fast pace. We hopped in the car, and I moved it to a more defensive position. The same man came close enough to almost hit our vehicle. She hopped out of the car at that point and ran towards the guy. I immediately knew I was fucked. I got out and gave them commands to back up and get on the ground. Neither of them complied, obviously. The man proceeded to charge me and knock me to the ground. Luckily, I was able to get him on his back and get up. I saw my date grab a metal pipe from the van. She told me they had a gun and to give them my money and truck and I wouldn't get hurt. Of course, with my I'm invincible mentality, I told them no. She started to cry and said they didn't want to hurt me. He then started going back towards the car. At that point, I told them I was a police officer and drew my concealed firearm. I told them to get on the ground right now. After a moment of shock from them, they complied, and I was able to call 911. 
I told them my name and badge number, and that I had two at gunpoint and needed backup immediately. I gave our dispatcher the best directions I could to the field, but while on the phone, they both fled. Again, stupid new cop young guy mentality. I chased them. I took off after the man, who ran into the woods around the field. I chased him for maybe 30 seconds, and heard three loud pops and saw muzzle flash. My invincible mentality went right out the window. I ran like hell back towards my car, and peeled the hell out of there. I went back to the area I'd picked her up in, called dispatchers again, and had the officers come to that location. Of course, the first one to pull up was my sergeant and my field training officer. They were both completely understanding, and totally didn't give me any shit at all. I think the most used words were dumbass and stupid fucking rookie. I hopped in their car and we went towards the field. Luckily, the van was still there. I was told to shut my mouth and only come out if they started getting shot at. They cleared the area and started looking in the van. They found meth right on the center console and searched the car. What scared me the most was when my field training officer and sergeant came back to the patrol car, let me out, and told me to come look in the back of the van. Both of them were pale and looked horrified. I went to the back of the van. There were several knives, duct tape, lighter fluid, a decent amount of rifle ammunition, handcuffs, and what looked like dried blood. In the front passenger side, we found an AR-15 style rifle and two more handguns. We called for immediate backup and detectives. When they investigated the blood though, it turned out it was not blood at all. The plates had been stolen, and the van was a reported stolen vehicle as well. I still get shit about the whole encounter, but luckily no one got hurt. I'll never use online dating again though. My girlfriend and I were on this off-trail hike that had an extremely long and steep cliff to reach a small rock overhang that looked over the cliffs and the ocean. As it came into view, we noticed there was already an old lady sitting up there with a sketch pad. We started making jokes saying maybe it was not a woman but actually Norman Bates waiting to throw us off the cliff or something. For about 20 minutes, we were kidding around like this, and as we finally approached, you couldn't see the top because it was so steep now. We finally made it to the top of the tiny overhang. At that point, the old woman turned around to look at us, and we noticed it was an insane-looking man wearing a dress, not a woman at all. His hair was tied in small braids with rubber bands. To be clear, this was not like a normal-looking cross-dressing person having a quiet afternoon to themselves in the wilderness. Their eyes were bug-eyed, and they almost looked like an escaped convict or something. We said hello, and the man said nothing at all, but stared at us. We tried to act as normal as possible, and calmly turned around and headed back down. We got the hell out of there not long after. Let me preface this by saying that I realize camping alone in the middle of nowhere is not exactly the smartest activity a person can engage in. I've lost count of the amount of times that well-meaning busybodies have lectured me about it, but frankly, I just don't care. You see, all my life I've done things I didn't particularly want to do. I went to school, I got a job, I paid my bills, Camping in the stillness and solitude of the forest at night was the one thing that gave me joy. And joy seemed to be in short supply most days. I never felt afraid in the woods, no matter how remote. I only ever felt calm and peaceful, like I was doing what I was always meant to do. Now mind you, that does not mean I never took any precautions at all. There are three things a solitary woman needs in the woods. First, a good first aid kit. Second, a good compass. And third, a good dog. 
I always went down with all three. I always thought those things would keep me safe from whatever might be out there in the forest. I was wrong, of course, but that was just because there were some threats I had never considered. The last camping trip I'll ever take started out fairly normally. I had planned a three-night loop through a stretch of woods I had never been to before. It was unfamiliar and had very remote terrain. In fact, I would not be following an established trail. I was only planning on hiking about eight miles a day before setting up camp each evening. That way, I would never be too exhausted to make good decisions. I could also generally enjoy my new surroundings more thoroughly. I loaded up my pack with all the supplies I'd need. I told my parents where I'd be and when I'd return and headed out to a part of the state that was completely foreign to me. I arrived at the forest early in the day and parked alongside a deserted stretch of gravel road. I could see no signs that the road had been driven down in quite some time. The thought of having an entire section of the woods all to myself filled me with a moment of glee. That moment intensified when I opened the passenger side of my car to let Susie out. Susie was the type of dog that provoked endless speculation about her genetic line, but ultimately she was just several different kinds of mutt all rolled into one. Not particularly intimidating to look at, though. Susie was very loyal and protective all the same. I would never go on a hike without her by my side, and she was never happier than when she was walking along with me. Susie gave me confidence that I could handle whatever the wilderness threw my way. With my pack loaded high and heavy on my back, Susie and I headed out into the woods. The route I had chosen was quite rugged and varied, and often I had to stop to check my map and compass. I had opted to walk along the ridge line the first day, and found that the way was a gauntlet of loose rocks and fallen trees. There were no signs of humanity there at all. No empty bottles, no trails to pull me back into civilization. Despite the hard going, it was paradise to me. That evening, I set up camp at a clearing near one of the higher ridges. I turned in a bit earlier than I'd originally wanted to, driven into my tent by the cold bite of the early fall air. Susie snuggled in next to me as I zipped myself into my sleeping bag. Before I knew it, I had been lulled into sleep by the chorus of the chirping night insects around me. I was woken up in the early morning hours, though, to complete silence. A quick glance at my watch showed it was around 1.45 a.m., too early to be anything other than dead asleep. The full moon above illuminated the night sky, and I spent several seconds watching the shadows of the tree branches dancing along the top of my tent. It was downright cold by then. I zipped my sleeping bag more tightly. I looked over at Susie still laying next to my body. Her eyes were open and focused on something beyond the tent. The wind must have woken her too, I thought. I closed my eyes, hoping to fall quickly back to sleep when I felt Susie growl against me. I murmured a reassurance. It's probably just a deer pup or something. Though, something didn't feel right here. Susie wasn't the type of dog to growl at anything passing by. She lived her life as though other creatures were curiosities at best and distractions at worst. The only time I'd ever heard her growl like that was two years ago when a black bear came shuffling down a trail and caught us off guard. In a weird way, the thought of a bear outside the tent was a bit of a relief. My bat was hung from a tree outside, and bears in this part of the country weren't known to be aggressive at all. I stroked Susie's fur and waited for the animal to sniff around the campground, determine that we weren't interesting, and then leave after a short while. I strained to listen, but all I could hear was the sound of Susie's growling, slow and constant. I waited for what seemed like hours, but never heard the animal outside. As the morning went on, Susie's growl had turned into soft whimpers. I let her crawl into my sleeping bag with me. The sleep that came was fitful and interrupted by strange nightmares. 
The morning sun eventually made its way in and woke me up. You may be wondering at this point why I didn't turn around and walk right back out of the woods to my car and drive back to civilization. Well, the simple reason is that I wasn't too worried. I thought an animal had come around the campsite. It wasn't that big a deal. Besides, I'd be another eight miles away by the time night came around again. I packed myself up, had a leisurely breakfast, and set out again. The morning hike was uneventful and beautiful, though Susie stuck disconcertingly close by me, neglecting her usual explanation. Every time I tried to pet her, she stiffened, so I let her be and continued walking. We stopped in a quiet clearing for a late lunch, more than six miles into the day's hike. It wasn't until I was packing up to leave that I noticed the complete silence in this area. No birds, no cicadas, no rustling of leaves where squirrels were leaving from the trees. It sent a chill down my spine. I noticed Susie watching the woods ahead. Let's get out of here, girl. She looked up at me and whined. When we arrived at the edge of the woods, I immediately saw why there were no bird songs in this area. There were many little feathered bodies laying across the forest floor, dotting the fallen leaves with red, blues, whites, and yellows. I poked a bluebird with my hiking stick, turning it over looking for any signs of predation or illness. I saw nothing strange other than the mere fact it was a lifeless body. I expected to need to call Susie to me. Birds were a favorite snack of hers, but she had backed up behind me, another low growl escaping her curled lips. I stepped back to her and clipped a leash to her collar, fearing that she might run. The woods remained dead silent. My heart had frozen in my chest. It clenched tightly, but somehow was beating forcefully at the same time. Something was very wrong here. I knew I needed to get out of here. I stood where I was and tried to think about things. I was about 14 miles from where I'd parked my car. If I went back the way I came, given the terrain, I knew I wouldn't make it back before nightfall. I had in my pack a compass and a map. I could try to map out a new route, one that might take me back faster, but there was no guarantee I could find my way back before dark either. I was at the halfway point of the route, and I had to make the decision to keep going or turn back. I thought back to the campsite the night before. Something was out there. Maybe it was just a bear, but maybe it was something else. The thought of going back to that spot to sleep made me shudder. I knew I had to keep going. I'd get as many miles as I could during the rest of the daylight hours. Get a few hours of sleep and then finish tomorrow ahead of schedule. I just had to make it through another night, and I'd be back to my car. I steadied myself and forged ahead. Susie was tense beside me, hackles raised. The miles melted behind us. There were no stops and no breaks to look at flowers or have a snack or anything. Just the constant sound of my boots striking the ground to break out the unnatural quiet. When I came to the next clearing, I had to step carefully through a mass of bodies where a flock of starlings had been downed. As I walked, I kept an eye on the trees around me, but saw no movement, only that awful stillness. Slowly, the light began to fade. Its rays became orange and diffused through the leaves. I knew I had to stop. I couldn't keep going through the night like this. The tent, though made of polyester and carbon fiber, would at least allow me the illusion of security. I found a clearing mostly devoid of all these dead birds and set up camp there. Susie whimpered. It's okay, girl. We'll be out of here tomorrow. I promise. I was in my tent before the sun finished its descent behind the trees and wrapped tightly around one of my hiking poles and Susie right next to me. Whatever or whoever was out there, I just hoped they would leave me alone. I drifted in and out of consciousness, the strain of the day overcoming me in waves before the nightmares pulled me back into the waking world. Susie didn't sleep at all as far as I could tell. She just laid there very stiffly, every so often emitting another low growl and licking her lips nervously. 
While I was awake, I listened to the wind moving the branches above me, but nothing else was making a sound. I mentally clung to the creaks and groans of the trees, something familiar and reassuring in this strange place. Eventually, though, that too became twisted and bizarre. The branches swayed above me, casting shadows across the top of my tent. The wind sounded as if it were dying down now. I sat up in my sleeping bag, freeing my arms and drawing Susie closer to me. The warmth of her little body and the feeling of her breathing gave me comfort. That was moments before we both heard it, a crunch of heavy footfalls right outside. Susie lunged for the tent door, frantically clawing at the fabric and whining. I tried to hold her still, but she was fighting me back at every turn. When the fabric ripped, there was nothing I could do. She bolted into the night before I could even process what just happened. I fought my way out, still clutching the hiking pole, but hopelessly aware of how little good it would do me. I emerged into the little clearing of my campsite, illuminated by a full moon. The trees were motionless, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The hairs on the back of my neck stood to attention. The only thing I could hear was my own ragged breathing and the quick percussion of blood through my ears. I backed slowly into the bark of the nearest tree, feeling totally exposed in the clearing. Minutes passed by, or maybe hours. The silence continued around me. I could think of nothing else to do, standing alone and vulnerable in the night, so I started talking, at first to myself and then to whatever was there with me. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to disturb you. I'm leaving, I swear, just one more day and I'll be gone. I began to cry. My voice started to sound hoarser and hoarser as the night went on. By the time the gray morning light began to seep through the trees, I was numb from fear. I was unsure I could even find the strength in my legs to hike out of this place, but I did. I left my tent where it lay, now visibly in tatters, and started into the woods alone. The rest of the day barely registered with me. If I'm being completely honest, I remember the silence and the feeling of being watched. When I finally made it back to my car, I didn't even have the energy to cry. Sometime later, when I felt well enough to revisit my experience, I looked up this corner of nowhere online. I read stories about the isolation in the wilderness of the forest, about the logging crews who had abandoned their machinery, and how the trails had all become overgrown and useless. I had seen those stories before my trip, and they excited me. The solitude of it all, the remote rugged terrain that had driven the less adventurous away. But now I had more context. I understood that this type of forest was not for me. It wasn't for any of us, and I'm pretty sure it will stay that way for a long time. So this happened a few months ago, and I'm still scared to this day. My entire life, I had never really walked home from school all the way. I had always either been picked up or ridden the bus. This year was the first year that I lived near enough the school to walk. I wasn't in the nearby neighborhood where 90% of the kids were. We were only living in our current house temporarily. I would have to walk maybe half a mile to get home, across the highway. At the beginning of the year, when I first started walking home, I didn't want to have to walk by the highway. The high school had a cut through in the forest that led to a strange and creepy lone road. I wanted to get home fast. I walked down to the forest to get to the cut through point, when I saw that some older kids appeared to be following me. Maybe I was just being paranoid, though. I ignored them, and they actually did turn out to be unimportant. For some reason in my head, I had the Halloween theme just stuck in there, like when Michael Myers would stalk people. It was a really eerie sensation. My gut feeling was that maybe I should have taken the highway instead. Still, though, considering the thing with those older kids turned out to be nothing... I kept on just walking through the forested area. 
and got to that lonely road made out of gravel. There was dead grass right in the middle of it growing out. I could see the area where the highway is. The road seemingly extended deep into this brambly forest. I decided maybe this was a waste of time. I turned around and took the highway path instead. The next day though, I didn't want to give up. I wanted to conquer my fear of this road, so I foolishly went back. It was the same thing. As I walked down that eerie lone road with dead overgrown shrubs growing on it, I kept getting this eerie feeling the whole time. I noticed there were absolutely zero cars or people coming up and down this road. It was like it was completely abandoned. I kept walking into these big spider webs right in the middle of it, which proved pretty much that there hadn't been cars there in a long time. Otherwise, how would there be so many webs between all these trees? I continued walking down this road leading to nowhere, just going deeper and deeper. I was starting to get a bit scared at this point that a car would come down the road and not see me, or maybe somebody would come and take me. Who would even hear me scream out here? I started jogging up the center. I saw a big gap in the forest where there were power lines. Finally, I thought to myself, the ground next to the lines was still overgrown and full of tall grass and thorns. I kept walking into this area, taking my sweet time. I finally made it to a small ravine. I jumped over it and continued on my way. I eventually got stuck though. There was a big bush. I didn't want to walk through all the tall grass around it and get dirty. I must have been trying to work out how to get around the bush for a good two minutes, when suddenly I was slammed with an ominous sensation. I looked up and saw a man standing a good distance away from me. I didn't move or say a word. My heart was pounding. This man was very creepy. He had dark green clothes and shaggy brown hair. He was just staring at me. A big grin came over his face, and he gestured for me to come over to him. He then stepped to the side, where I could no longer see him. I could hear the leaves crunching, though. He was coming after me. The adrenaline had been flowing for about 30 seconds now. I bolted lightning fast up the hill. I didn't care about not getting dirty anymore. I just knew I needed to get the hell out of there. Eventually, I emerged back to the highway area. I turned back to look, but there was no sign of the creepy man. I made it home just fine, and I promised I was never going to try to cut through that forest again. The scariest thing is, though, if he had just stepped slightly to the side before I had seen him in that forest, I would have never noticed him coming. I could have made it up to that area. He would have grabbed me easily, and I would never be seen again. The way he grinned and made his way towards me was very eerie too. Any normal adult would have said something like, Hey, are you lost? Can I help you? Nope. This guy just stood there and stared at me for who knows how long. All I know is it caught me completely by surprise. I can safely say I've never tried that shortcut again. I will occasionally go to the top of the highway and look down that path, but I'll never go deep down that road ever again. It's so weird how it seemingly leads to nowhere. I've not encountered the creepy dude since, and hopefully I never will again. So I live on a remote New England street. I just moved here recently from New Mexico. We moved into a gorgeous house about four driveways up from a Mormon church. This church has services at random times. I'm agnostic and not really tuned in to the schedule that they keep. Tonight I was driving home from work and listening to a new episode from True Crime Garage podcast. I didn't want to stop listening, so instead of driving home, I slowed down my speed so I could finish my episode. I decided to do a slow lap around the church. As I listened, I was super paranoid because of all my true crime obsessions. My car doors always remained locked, 
Because we live in a safe and upper-class neighborhood, though, I was not terribly on high alert, even though the church was dark. As I cruised slowly around it to enjoy my podcast some more, all of a sudden, a man stepped out of the shadows from behind the church's dumpster and out into the light. He was walking in a bizarre stumbling gait and actually lunged at my car door. He had a beard and was otherwise kempt and clean-looking, so what was with his odd manner of acting? It really scared me, so I floored it and drove off as fast as possible. He lurched after my SUV again, his nails actually scratching the metal of my back door. I was so freaked out that I drove for a long while, not going home but just kind of circling random streets, until I finally arrived. My husband is out of town for training. He's military, so it was just me and my two pit bulls. They made me feel pretty safe. I do also have a gun that my husband bought me. As an aforementioned true crime addict, I'm always on edge. I called up my husband for reassurance, and he assured me it was probably just a homeless guy, but to keep the gun at the ready and the dogs by my bed, just in case. I start doing my nightly routine and head to bed. As I'm falling asleep though, my dogs start going wild, barking and rushing from door to window. I kept my hand on my gun as I listened to them barking over the pounding of my own heart. I could hear the front door knob rattling as someone tried to twist it open. My dogs were still snarling and barking. After a few seconds, one of them hit the window downstairs, barking their head off. I slid out of my bed and grabbed my cell phone, dialing 911. About 30 minutes later, cop cars pulled into my yard and took my statement. I was still terrified and shaking, and when I went to the door to talk to them, the porch light illuminated footsteps all around my door in the snow. They circled around to each window. I could only imagine it was that same guy from the church earlier, but I have no idea how he knew which house was mine. I parked in the garage, so he must have been watching me as I came home, and recognized my vehicle as I pulled in. My husband is home now, but I'm scared stiff. I won't even walk in front of our uncurtained French doors. I'm that terrified. I've almost been kidnapped twice. This is the story about the second time. I just graduated from college and was living outside the major city my school was near. There's public transit around here that's relatively reliable, so sometimes I would go into the city for special occasions, knowing I could get back safely. For Halloween that year, my boyfriend and I decided to take the train and actually go to an event not just a house party. This is only important because of how it influenced my outfit. As a woman, there are a lot of footwear rules you have to follow. I was worried if I didn't wear heels, I might not be allowed into the club we were going to. I honestly debated for way too long, and switched between heels and flats a couple of times. I was wearing a black dress that I turned into a Black Widow Spider costume, by putting a red cutout on the front. In the end, I ended up wearing some black sneakers. The night was great and relatively uneventful. I didn't get hassled for my shoe wear at all, thankfully. At some point, I decided I was exhausted though and wanted to head home. My boyfriend was still going strong and didn't really want to leave yet. That wasn't really a problem though. Since we'd taken public transportation to get there, he gave me the keys to his house, which was about a mile from the train station. We planned that I would head back and he would join me a little bit later. The mile I had to cover went by a mall, a school, and finally a church, and abruptly ended and turned into a row of houses that my boyfriend lived on. There was a designated sidewalk the whole way, but it also ran along a four-lane road. I knew there was potential for running into late-night vagabonds, but I figured they'd mostly be around the station or the mall. 
By the time I was at the church, I could see my destination, which was the second house on the row. I considered myself safe as I passed the church on the right sidewalk. I was about 200 yards from the house now. When I hear a vehicle start to slow down as it approaches me on the left, the speed limit for the area was 35, but people often fly down it. I'd say about average, people go around 45 miles an hour on this road, given that there were two lanes each way. The van had been going 45 as well, because the sound of it slowing down rapidly was very noticeable. I turned and saw a white, hard-sided, really dark-tinted front window van pulling over. Luckily, it was going so fast it was not able to stop until it had passed me by, about 20 yards ahead. It just sat there, idling at the sidewalk. I stopped walking because there was no reason for a van to just suddenly stop like this out of nowhere. I didn't want to walk by the big sliding door. After about 30 seconds, which felt like an hour, of the van just idling there and no one getting out at all, I decided to quickly scoot on up to the church flower beds so I wouldn't be close enough to be grabbed by anyone. At first, nothing happened as I passed by, and I felt dumb for being paranoid. That's exactly when I sent a thousand prayers for deciding to wear flats that night. After ten seconds of me walking onward, I heard the van gun its engine, and I watched as it zoomed by and screeched to a stop in front of me, about ten feet away. It literally jumped the curb onto the sidewalk, with the tail sticking out into the road. Hearing the driver's door now opening sent a jolt of adrenaline I've never felt before or since through my body. I took off sprinting in my glorious sneakers. As I passed the front of the van, I saw the driver passing the side mirror, meaning he was already outside the car, attempting to make his way to me. As anticlimactic as it is, that's basically the end of the story though because I hauled my ass all the way to my house without stopping, running the fastest I've ever run. I'm pretty sure I could have given an Olympic athlete a run for their money. I even cut through some trees to lose him. I wasn't pursued any further. As far as I could tell, the man chasing me was not able to keep up. I got inside and locked the door, and spent the rest of the night just fine. I'll always be grateful I ended up wearing flats that night so I could run for my life properly. I don't really like considering what might have happened if I had been wearing heels instead. Despite living out in the middle of nowhere on a 400-acre farm, somehow we've still had problems with someone coming into our home, moving our stuff around, and occasionally even taking something, like trash bags or food. It started in early 2016. We would be laying in bed and hear random stuff being moved around in the middle of the night. And by the time we'd get up to check though, there would be no one there. Still though, the damage was done to our old front door after someone tried to get in several times. This behavior wasn't consistent either. It actually only really happened once or twice every couple of months. Last month, though, I heard a car door shut in the middle of the night. When we went to check, the lights were on inside. Our motion detector lights had tripped outside, too. This would continuously happen at all hours of the night after that. Well, I saw this person for the first time last night. It was only a brief glimpse, and they were wearing dark clothes as well, so I didn't really get a good look. By the time my husband got out there to confront them, they were already gone again. We don't know where they go to, but we always hear them running. Sometimes down the left side of our house out towards the field, where there are woods beyond, and sometimes down the right side. Today, I had my music playing over a speaker in the kitchen while I jumped in the shower briefly. Not four to six minutes after, though, I heard the sound of my music shutting off suddenly. I got a real bad feeling. 
I felt like I should just stay locked in the bathroom and not go to investigate at all. I'm glad I did. My music had been paused, as my phone had been moved completely. The front door was hanging wide open, and there were mud tracks all over the floor. I've always had an issue with anxiety, and I'm kind of a paranoid person anyway. It's super hard for me to attempt to stay calm with all of this going on. My husband will be home soon, and keeps texting to make sure everything is okay. I'm not stressing too bad, because I know that's not good for the baby. Still though, I hope we can eventually figure out who's stalking our house, and that we can find some way to get rid of them for good. My family were hiking a mountain in Alaska. We were down in a valley a couple of miles from the summit, taking a rest at a scenic spot with a few other groups of people. There were maybe 20 to 30 in total. Some lady in the group got a phone call from someone at the summit. The person at the top could see a black bear up on the slope, heading down to us. There were three cubs on the opposite slope, and us in between. Everyone started panicking and just ran. Some people tried to go up the mountain, and some down. Nobody wanted to be in between, for obvious reasons. It was honestly more scary because of the way people reacted than the actual threat of the bear itself. Lots of people around us were old or had small children, but nobody seemed to care about anyone except themselves. They left all the kids and old people behind. We undoubtedly would have been completely safe if people had just been calm and stayed as a group, doing all the things you're supposed to do when a bear's nearby. But everything the park rangers drilled into us for an hour before we went up there was just completely forgotten in a moment. Several people were almost trampled to death. It was a frightening scene. During my first and only semester of college, my very good friend Sheik was dating this girl named Stacy that we both knew from high school and was 18 at the time. I'm now 26 years old. Now, many people back in high school did not like Stacy, and I was one of them. To me, she was the definition of a sketchy person. She was a pathological liar and not even a good one either as her stories very rarely added up. She would constantly contradict herself, sometimes only minutes after she'd spouted her lies. She was one of those girls that hated drama too, yet it always seemed to magically follow her around everywhere. She was constantly in and out of relationships throughout high school and would constantly go out of her way to prove that they were crazy by spreading rumors about her exes and getting as much sympathy from everyone around her as she could. She always had to be the center of attention. Wherever she went, I remember something bad happening along with her. I remember during prom night, she was dancing with her then-boyfriend. He accidentally stepped on her foot while dancing, and she caused a huge scene about how he was physically abusing her. It was painful to watch. There's much more I could get into about this girl, but just to say in general, she's an extremely toxic person. Nobody should have to be subjected to or be in the presence of her. It was also worth noting she had a drug problem that she would often try to hide. As you might imagine, this will come into play later. Anyway, back to the story. Sheik and Stacy had class together and hit it off rather quickly. He was skeptical at first, but when he brought up her reputation in high school, Stacy claimed that she was weird by an ex-boyfriend, and that was why she acted out in the way she did. She was working on getting better, and was now perfectly fine. My friend, being incredibly insecure about being single, and being way too trusting in other people, believed her right away. He began dating her, and almost immediately the relationship became extremely dysfunctional. It was rampant with emotional abuse and manipulation on her end. 
The aspect I really want to focus on, though, was her constantly trying to squeeze money out of him, and her aforementioned drug problem. She would constantly ask him for small amounts of money, usually ranging between $10 and $20. Sheik didn't mind all that much. He bought into her story of struggling financially and felt real bad. One day, though, she asked him for too much, $500 to cover her rent, to which he refused. She immediately flipped out on him and didn't talk to him until she drunk dialed him later that night and began to reveal she was doing drugs. It was all because of how terrible her life was and that he wasn't helping at all. Honestly, I have no idea why he didn't just break up with her there and then, but the next day they talked it out and made up. The issue was dropped, but that's where everything finally started to come to a head. It was around 10.30ish on a Friday night. Keep in mind they had been dating for nearly two months at this point. I was chilling in my room with another friend of mine. We were just sitting on the couch bullshitting about random things going on in our lives when I get an urgent call from Sheik. He explained to me that Stacy was hanging out at a friend's house and asked him if he could come pick her up around midnight. The buses in that area had stopped running after 8, and she needed to be at work by 9 the next morning. He said sure, and as the time he needed to leave to pick her up drew closer, his mother called him saying she was working overtime and wouldn't be out until around midnight. She had the car, so he asked me if I could drive with him to go pick up Stacy. I'll admit I would have rather left her to her own devices, but he sounded pretty desperate, and he was an amazing friend who would do anything for me. I decided to do him a solid, and told him to start walking over to my house. He arrived about 40 minutes later. My other friend went back to her own house. She lived right across the street from us anyway. I got in the car and he texted Stacy, telling her that we were leaving now and that I was driving him, to which she responded with a dreaded K. We got to Stacy's friend's house, which was located on the very outskirts of town in a sketchy neighborhood. The area was very poorly lit, and just to my luck, the streetlight in front of her friend's house was completely broken and off. I refused to park there, as I didn't feel comfortable sitting in the dark. I parked three houses down between two other cars, under one of the few functioning streetlights. He texted Stacy, Hey, we're here! She didn't respond. As we were waiting there, a truck drove by, and I noticed four men inside. At first, I figured maybe they were lost and looking for an address but this thought was thrown out the window when not even two minutes later, the truck drove by again, this time much slower. The guy in the front passenger seat made direct eye contact with me as the truck passed by my car. I told Gish something was definitely wrong here and to call Stacy right now so we could leave as soon as possible. He agreed and called her. It was dead quiet outside, so I could hear the conversation pretty well. Hey, where are you? We're down the block. Come outside. I'm looking outside right now. I don't see your car. We're in my friend's car. It's a gray Subaru. Almost immediately after, the phone call dropped out. He looked at his phone in complete confusion, wondering what the hell was going on. I was starting to get extremely nervous now, though. Between the truck that was circling around before and Stacy's sketchy behavior... I decided that something was up here, and I was not just going to be a sitting duck. I pulled out of the spot and drove up in front of the house. As I'm pulling out, though, I heard a vehicle loudly in the distance behind us. I look up in my rearview mirror and see the truck from before now gunning it up the block. I freaked out and floored it out and began speeding up the block as well. The truck caught up with us, and Sheik yelled at me to turn, that they were trying to shoot the car. To my horror, I looked behind me, and the guy in the back seat was leaning out the window with a gun in his hand, aiming directly at us. I quickly turned and floored it down the road, as they struggled to follow behind us. I turned left, narrowly missing an oncoming car, and slammed down on the gas. Luckily, I was halfway down the block, by the time they'd even turned out onto the road. I was surprised I was driving as well as I was at the time. 
My friend said I looked extremely calm and determined during all of this, but inside I was clearly freaking out. I was worried they were going to run me off the road, or we'd even get a bullet in the back of our skulls. I made another left turn and drove like a bat out of hell towards the highway. The truck turned onto the block but then stopped as I got closer. I turned onto the highway and emerged into the next lane. A few minutes passed by, with us going back and forth on who the fuck those guys were and what they wanted. That's when he got a call from Stacy. He picked it up and put it on speaker, and shakily said, Hello? Where are you? I'm fucking waiting for you, she screamed. He explained the situation, to which she proceeded to call him a liar, and said he was never there and he was standing her up. Of course, he lost his shit at her. He screamed at her that we'd almost gotten killed, and called her out on her bizarre behavior. Throughout all of this, she started yelling again, but then she went silent. We heard a door open quietly, and someone in the background calling out. They got away. Stacy, where the fuck are you? Silence followed this for a few seconds, before the line went dead. We looked at each other, and we both knew she had something to do with all of this. Long story short, we spent the entire drive theorizing on why this all happened. We think we may have hit the spot on what actually occurred. When she'd asked for the $500, she probably needed the money to pay off a dealer or something. She had to find another way to pay off her debt. We think she set us up to head to that house. And those guys were probably the dealer and his buddies who would conveniently show up looking to rob us of everything and possibly jack the car, hoping it would cover her debt. She probably hadn't realized we were using my car, which explains why they circled the block in confusion and why she hung up the phone immediately after he gave her a description of my vehicle. She'd possibly called the dealers to update them. I dropped him off at his house and went home myself. I know people say that after scary encounters, they're always shaken up and their emotions are running in a million directions. I was just emotionally drained. It felt like I couldn't feel anything. I just wanted to go home and go to bed, which is what I immediately did. I filed the police report the next morning on those guys. They said they would look into it, but I never heard anything from them after I filed the report, so who knows what they've been up to ever since. As far as Stacy goes, our theory was further solidified when he showed up to class on Monday. She approached him and berated him for that night, claiming that she'd walked all the way home and had her phone and wallet stolen by some druggies. He basically called her out on the whole thing, claiming she'd set us up to be robbed. Of course, she denied and called him crazy. He told her they were done and she yelled fine and walked to the back of the room. The druggies were outside waiting for her. To our surprise, she never attempted to contact us again and kept her distance, probably because she knew we were onto her and wanted to keep the heat off her. After I dropped down, I never saw her again, and last I heard anything about her was from my friend, who told me she'd developed a long-distance relationship with some guy and dropped out halfway through the semester to move up north to live with him. As far as I know, that was the last time anyone ever saw or heard from her. Overall, I'm just happy I trusted my instincts and picked up on the fact that something was wrong. This encounter may have had a very different outcome. This happened to me back in the summer of 1989 on a remote speck of land in Pawnee, Kansas, back when I was 30 years old. It was early evening, and the sun was setting. There was a warm breeze outside, which I remember clearly. I had just burnt a bag of popcorn in my defective microwave, and had flung open the windows to air out the kitchen some. I don't remember what I left my house to go and find but I do recall that after tossing the burnt bag of popcorn in the trash can, I exited out the back door and began walking towards the barn. I remember hearing a noise off to my left in the field. It sounded like a faint coughing of some sort, but I ignored it at first. My mind was focused on other things, and I wasn't even remotely worried about or considering the possibility a complete stranger could have been wandering across my property. 
As it turns out, I probably should have been. When I exited the barn and made my way back towards the house, I stopped dead in my tracks as I made eye contact with a very large and extremely unkempt man. He was about 10 yards away from me. Judging by the amount of gray on his enormous beard, I determined him to be at least 60 or older. He was barefoot and wearing stained overalls in addition to suspenders over his bare torso. It struck me as unnecessary and strange. His body looked extremely worn down and tired. His eyes were wild and fierce and full of malice. In his right hand, I could see he was carrying a hatchet. Before I could even form a sentence, I already visualized in my head how many steps it would take for him to reach me. I was all alone, a vulnerable young woman with no one around for miles to hear me scream, trapped out in the open by this man, who appeared to have sprung out from the grass, blocking the path to my house now. I'm not sure how long we stood there in a silent stalemate, but I recall I was about to ask him what he wanted. That was when the man spoke up. I remember his voice was much deeper and more elegant than I expected it to be. I'll spare you for some whiskey. I stammered something that I don't quite recall. The man raised his voice and screamed at me. Whiskey, now! I took a reflexive step back. The man started stomping towards me. He didn't raise the hatchet but I'll never forget the hatred in his eyes as he closed the distance between us. And that's when it happened. Blood exploded out of the side of his head, and he collapsed onto the grass, making a sound like a grunt. I might be remembering things slightly out of sequence, but I thought I heard the crack of a rifle echo after he fell. I didn't stop to think or look twice. I sprinted for my kitchen, terrified that someone would fire a second shot at me. Once inside, I should have locked the door and called for help. Instead, I grabbed my car keys and ran out the front door. I climbed into my tiny red Volvo and drove to the nearest police station. It wasn't until I spoke to the officer at the desk that I realized I had blood spatter all over me. Three police cars escorted me home, at which point it was long after dark. They combed the area with flashlights and discovered a large pool of blood on my back lawn. There was no body, though. Not even the hatchet was left behind. They set up a perimeter and expanded their search, but by the time dawn came around and my husband returned, they had found nothing. No trace of the bearded man or whoever had fired the rifle. They asked me multiple questions about the man and the sound of the gunshot. I suppose they were trying to determine the caliber and perhaps deduce how far away the gunman had been standing. The incident happened so fast though that there was not really much information I could give them. The police brought out their hounds who traced his scent for over a mile into our backwoods until the trail suddenly went cold. Nothing further was ever discovered or reported to me. To this day, I can't describe exactly who that bearded man was, nor who ended his life right in front of my eyes. My family suggested he may have been an escaped convict or a deranged madman, and whoever fired that shot must have been hunting him. They chose to act in that moment to save my life, because I have no doubt that bearded man would have done some serious harm to me. Sometimes, I bring myself to feel grateful for that unseen shooter, but other days, I'm not so sure. Regardless of whatever my family suspects, I'll never know for sure if that person with the rifle had not actually been aiming at me. This happened a couple of days ago to me and my girlfriend. We were house-setting for my girlfriend's dad. My girlfriend's dad lives in a rather large house in a suburban neighborhood just outside of one of the major cities in Denmark. What I'm trying to say here is this is not exactly a scary or dangerous neighborhood by any means. That only means this gave us a much bigger scare than it probably would have had it been in a more dangerous part of town. 
After coming home from buying groceries and stocking up on necessities for our weekend stay at this house, we went to the living room to lie down and have some quality time to ourselves, which we hadn't had in quite a long time now. Before I go any further, let me just clarify the lay of the land here. This house had a rather large living room and a floor-to-ceiling window at the end of the room. Outside this floor-to-ceiling window was a sensor-triggered light system. As we were lying there watching TV, I started to get this weird feeling, like something was watching me. At first, I tried to shake it off like it was no big deal. I was thinking to myself that I was probably just overthinking things because I was in a new house, where I didn't yet feel entirely at home. As I looked over to my girlfriend though, I could see that she too was quite shaken up about something. After a few minutes of silence, she asked me if I had the same feeling as her, as if someone was watching us. I tried to play it off as nothing, and I told her I'd just go grab a cigarette and check to see if anyone was out there real quick, just to make us feel safer. I turned my head towards the floor-to-ceiling window, only to notice the lights were on outside. That shook me to my very core. I quickly decided not to go out for that cigarette. I could feel my girlfriend squeezing my arm. As I turned around to her, I saw her pointing out of one of the windows. Outside was a silhouette of a person. My blood froze in that moment. I turned around and quickly grabbed my phone. As I turned back, I could see the person had already disappeared. I called my parents as I knew they were out at a friend's house not too far from where we were. My dad told me to lock all the doors and windows and sit tight and wait for them to arrive. A couple of minutes go by and nothing happened other than me trying to get my girlfriend to calm down. I knew how badly this could affect her blood sugar levels and I'd rather not have her have a seizure while a creeper, burglar, or even a murderer was skulking about outside the house. The silence was broken by the sound of the windows being tampered with. At this point, I was trying really hard not to freak out and cause any further panic. Luckily, seconds later, I heard my dad pull up outside the house. My girlfriend and I have since discussed who it might have been, and we've come up with a few possible suspects, one of them being my girlfriend's crazy mother, who has a severe mental illness. The other more possible suspect would just be a simple burglar. I don't really care who it might have been. I'm just glad whoever it was was scared off by my dad and didn't manage to break in that night. This happened four years ago, in the early hours of New Year's Day. For reference, I was 17 at the time, and I was in my senior year of high school. I was around 5'10 and weighed about 160 pounds at the time. I lived in the suburbs. I was at a New Year's party being held by a friend of mine, whose house was about a 20-minute walk away from my own. It was around 1 in the morning, and I was about to leave with another friend of mine who lived on the same block as me. The friend who was hosting the party asked me if I wanted a ride home. In hindsight, we probably should have taken him up on his offer. Our neighborhood was pretty safe though, and we figured that with two of us walking together, no one would bother us. Plus, there were probably other people at the party who would need a ride home more than we did. We said our goodbyes to everyone and began our walk home. The road was predictably empty, with no one but us walking along the sidewalk and maybe the occasional car passing by. Everything was pretty well lit, so we weren't walking in complete darkness or anything. My friend wanted to pick up a pack of cigarettes on the way home, so we stopped off at a gas station along the way. When we got to the gas station, it was nearly empty, with only a woman at the pump filling up her car and a guy outside the front of the store on his phone. We went inside and my friend bought a pack of cigarettes. As we walked out of the store, my friend was immediately lighting one. We reached the sidewalk when we heard someone yelling from behind us. Hey man, wait up! 
We looked behind us to see the guy who had been out front the store quickly walking to us. He looked to be as early as his mid-twenties. He was around 5'8 and 140 pounds by the looks of him. He approached us and asked if he could get a light as well. My friend and I didn't think much of it. He lit the guy's cigarette and the guy thanked him. We began walking away, but the guy continued to follow behind us. He asked us where we were going, and we told him that we were headed home. He said that he was having a party and he was heading back over there, as he'd left for a moment to get some fresh air. He asked us if he wanted to come to the party with him. This is officially the point where red flags started going off. Why the hell would a guy in his mid-twenties ask two teenage boys if they wanted to go party with him? We told him bluntly we didn't even know who he was, nor did we know anyone at this party he was talking about either, so obviously we were not going. The guy started laughing and said we seemed like cool guys. He told us that we needed to lighten up. My friend and I told him we were underage to see if that would get him to leave us alone. He just chuckled and said that age didn't matter to him. He had a brother who was 16 at the party with him, and his friends were all there too. Jesus Christ, could this guy take a hint at all? I thought to myself. We were less than 10 minutes away from our houses now, and we didn't want this creep following us all the way there. I firmly told the man we were not going anywhere with him, and to quit following us. The guy got livid and started screaming at us for being unfriendly and inconsiderate, that he was just trying to be nice. He then started throwing racial slurs at my friend. It's worth mentioning that I'm white and my friend is black. My friend yelled at him to get away before he cracked him in the face. The guy then proceeded to run away from us. My friend and I looked at each other in complete disgust over what just happened and spent the next five minutes walking and talking about this creepy guy. We both agreed that he was probably drunk or high from a New Year's party. Next thing we know, though, we hear a car behind us. It proceeded to slow down to match our pace. We saw the windows roll down, which revealed the man we'd just seen a few minutes earlier. He appeared to be with two of his friends, one of which was a man the same age as the guy with a woman in the back seat, who had to have been in her mid-thirties. The guy told us we got off on the wrong foot, and asked us once again to join them at their party. My friend and I looked at each other, and I whispered to him that we needed to get away from them right now. My friend told him we were not going with them, and to leave us alone. The guy was silent for a few seconds, then said, You're coming with us one way or another. They pulled over quickly and jumped out of the car. That caused my friend and I to immediately go into flight mode. We turned right on the sidewalk. My friend yelled to run to the park and we'd lose them in there. We looked behind us, and to our horror, the three people were running right for us. We ran into the park and once again looked back. This time, they were even closer. We ran for a thick patch of trees that covered a good portion of the west side of the park hoping to evade them. I was panicking at this point because I couldn't see a damn thing. I was worried that my friend or I would trip over something and get captured by one of these sick freaks who wanted to do God knows what with us. We heard one of them trip and fall behind us, cursing out loud. We made a left onto the path and we heard more yelling behind. One of the guys was saying, Fuck, they got away! The woman yelled at them to split up and search the park. We bolted towards the bathrooms, which were thankfully still open. We hid inside and took a minute to catch our breaths. Our lungs were practically burning at this point. We should have called the cops and hid until they got there, but at the time we were so focused on getting the hell away from these crazy people that we decided to try and make our way to the nearest exit of the park and run to my house. We waited for about two minutes, then bolted out of the bathroom and towards the exit. Shortly after we exited the park, we heard one of the guys yell from somewhere behind us that he'd found us once more and we were getting away. We looked behind us to see the guy in the distance starting to chase after us. We ran until we reached my house and I quickly closed the door behind us. 
we were both sat there in silence, trying to regain our energy and calm down. We hoped they didn't see where we'd run off to. I looked out the window several times over the course of ten minutes. Thankfully, they never showed up again. We talked about it quite a bit, and we're glad we were both okay, and that nothing happened to us. We were trying to figure out what they wanted from us. Did they want to kill us, rob us, or something worse? My friend hung around for another half hour before he insisted on heading home alone. He left and I went to bed. I kept thinking about what happened. Eventually, I fell asleep. I woke up and told my parents about what occurred. They were thankful that me and my friend were okay, and they were upset with us that we chose to walk home. We should have accepted the lift from my other friend, or even called them. They would have come and picked us up regardless of what was going on. We filed a police report, and I gave them all the information I could. Unfortunately, we never heard anything about it again. Sometimes, I wonder what the hell they've been doing ever since. I really hope they never harmed another person after that. I can't express enough how thankful I am we managed to get away from those freaks. To this day, this incident is still the scariest thing that's ever happened to me in my life, and it definitely made me more wary of my surroundings. And I try my best to avoid situations where I need to walk home late at night. By myself or not, I don't know what would have happened if those people got their hands on me. But I do know one thing. I hope I never have to see them ever again. I worked at Six Flags last spring slash summer. Well, technically a freelance arts company leasing vending spots there. I was one of the oldest people hired, being 18 at the time. I just started attending college, while most of my other co-workers were still in high school. I took photos in a sort of old-timey dress-up shop. It was honestly one of the most fun jobs I've ever had. I was hired back in March of 2018 and started work in April. This was when the park was open on weekends only, before the official opening. I had been working for about a month, and the park was now open during the week as well, for less than 10 hours per day. I was able to work all day long pretty much, but was unfortunately the only one in the shop, as college was on summer break, and high school was still in session until mid-June. I'm sure you can tell where this story is going. I was alone all day during the weekdays, and only had co-workers on the weekends. I was so terribly alone during the day that I'd just walk across the path and watch my other co-workers doing things out of boredom. When I was outside of my shop area during the day, I began to notice that a man had started hanging around my area. I'd mainly see him walking by very slowly and staring at me, not blinking the entire time. I figured he was just a shy guy that wanted a picture inside and was too afraid or socially awkward to come in and speak to me. Deep down, he did give me an uneasy feeling, but I decided to ignore it. He was a customer in the park and so far he hadn't really done anything to me. I kept a smile and tried pulling in more customers all day every day. One day, I smiled and waved at him. That was probably my big mistake. He walked over briskly to stand in front of me and just kind of stared at me. I was creeped out and kind of scared of this guy, honestly. After like a full minute of just staring into my soul, he asked about the prices. After days of walking by and staring at me, I breathed a sigh of relief and started going through my memorized sales pitch. After I finished, he started to smile. It was not a normal smile, though. It was the kind that makes your skin crawl. He leaned in so close to my face that I could smell his breath. He asked how much it would be for him. I was confused as I'd just gone through my price list, so I stated that the prices were set and non-negotiable unless you were an art company employee or a park employee. He shrugged and just walked off. As I ran through my pitch to others during the day, a family had grown interested and wanted to take some pictures. 
I gladly took them into the shop and had a wonderful time photographing them. While I was checking the family out and collecting their payment, I looked up and saw the man was back. He was leaning against the chain barrier in front of my shop. The family collected their things and walked over to the chain. The man had to move to the sign for me to open it for them. I immediately closed it behind them as he tried pushing his way inside. I told him I was sorry, but only paying customers could come in. He wasn't allowed to do so unless he was considering a purchase. He frowned and walked away. I waited a few minutes, tidied everything up, and stepped back outside to continue working. It was almost closing time, so it was kind of pointless, but I had to stand outside and try to get more customers anyway, or else I'd get in trouble with my boss. I noticed the man one additional time that day. Across the way from me was a kind of carnival game or something. I could see him hiding behind it, peeking his head out and looking at me. I can't tell you just how eerie that sight was. He continued to do all of this for the entire week, and eventually I just learned to ignore him, which apparently he did not really like. On that Friday, as soon as the park opened, he startled me by making a beeline towards me. I was out front organizing outdoor props, and I froze. I hastily dropped what I was doing and went back inside, closing the chain behind me. The man paced back and forth in front of the store, muttering to himself and looking at me. I was so terrified, I was going to run to the phone and call security. He suddenly lurched forward, grabbing the chain in both of his hands. I'll never forget this moment. His eyes were completely wild, and he had that same menacing grin. He started whispering about the things he wanted to do to me. It was disgusting. He started ranting about how much he loved me, and we were meant to be together. How he wanted me to put him in a dress and humiliate him in front of all the people in the park. I was slowly backing up to the wall in my shop as he started laughing and yelling hysterically. I told him to go away and that I was going to call security. He got even more angry and said something that still keeps me up at night to this day. Even if you do, I'll be waiting for you when you get out. Meet me by the employee exit on your way, or else. He gave me that same disgusting smile and walked away. I went behind the counter and tried to compose myself. I never imagined I'd have something like this happen to me, let alone at work. Now that I had, all my knowledge of what to do went out the window, and I started crying like a little girl. I decided to tell my manager at the end of the day, because I didn't want to be afraid of coming into work. When I told him, he was completely mortified that I hadn't told him sooner. He walked me to a secret exit of the employee parking lot, so I wouldn't have to deal with the man. The next morning, we went to the security office, and I gave a description to all of the park security of what he looked like and what he would normally wear. I went back to my shop with two co-workers. Not even five minutes later, there he came strolling over with an angry look on his face. I hadn't ran into him last night, and he was furious. My co-workers noticed my panic as I ran and hid in the back. I hadn't told them about my situation yet. And when I did, they told me they would not leave me alone even after their shift was over, so the guy couldn't get to me. I called security and told them what he was wearing, so they updated the information. They posted an officer outside my shop as well. The man seemed to disappear because of that. When the officer had to leave to take care of something for a moment though, he immediately came back. Security realized that every time a clothed officer was around, he would hide away, so instead they posted a plainclothes officer across from my shop, posing as a customer. I was being used as bait ultimately, but I felt it was important to get a guy like this out of the park. Security eventually apprehended him later that day, as he was heading towards my shop again. They asked me for identification on him, and I remember breaking down and sobbing. The officer comforted me. Finally, the nightmare was over. He never physically threatened me or wielded a weapon, I guess, but he was doing enough verbal threats to make me fear for my life. They banned him from all six flag parks in the country, revoked his membership status, and took him into custody as well. 
Unfortunately, as there was no violent acts committed, they had to let him go. As I drove home that night, I saw him walking on the side of the road. I immediately sped away, in fear he would see me through the window and try to do something to me. At least he couldn't get to me at work anymore. I found a couple of weeks later from one of my security friends that he saw my stalker being arrested in a town over. I went and looked up the public arrest records for that town later that day and saw he'd been arrested for indecent exposure, public endangerment, and public intoxication. I know what happened to me might not be as severe as some other stories, but it was one of the most terrifying weeks in my life. You really don't think something like this will happen to you until it does. I'm a woman and I'm now 23. This happened around the time that I was 15 years old. I've had a couple of encounters that have been very creepy, but this one had me shaken to my very core. Around this time, it was my sophomore year of high school. A little backstory to understand the story I'm about to tell. At the time, I was kind of going through a phase, as most teenagers tend to do. I wore short shorts most of the time and fishnets as well. My shirts weren't really tops that a 15-year-old should wear, I think, but you know, we still do. I cringe at my outfits back then and my makeup, but that was just how it was. I was involved with my high school color guard. We're a part of the band, except we don't play instruments. Instead, we spin colorful flags. We also used rifles and sabers in our performances. Around this time, it was the fall, and we were practicing our show. We were doing a lot of reruns to try and perfect it before the usual competitions would start. Normally, practice would start at 4 and end at almost 9. Side note, I did not live close to my high school like most people that went there. The drive would take at least 15 minutes. Walking from my house to school would take about an hour, and taking the bus would take 45 minutes. My brother at this time worked late hours, and my parents didn't get off work until midnight. My next best choice was to take the bus home. The neighborhood was not the worst, but it wasn't safe enough to be walking home alone at night. Even before this night, I had always been a little bit on edge going home. On this particular night, I was saying goodbye to my friends and not wanting to bug them for a ride, so I walked over to my bus stop. I had my cell phone out and was scrolling through Facebook. I would occasionally glance up and check out my surroundings when I noticed a car slowing down in front of the bus stop. It immediately signaled to make a turn to my left. I didn't really think that much about it, since there are houses behind that area. It wasn't that weird, until I noticed this car doing that again, and again, and again. I get scared easily, and am already a paranoid enough person, so this had my alarm bells ringing right away. It wasn't until he had basically passed me by for the seventh time in a row, that he parked on the curb by the bus stop. That's when I got a better look at him, and took in his appearance. This happened a couple of years ago, so my memory is not perfect. I do remember he seemed to be Hispanic, and reminded me a bit of an uncle of a friend of mine. His first words sent me panicking. To translate what he said to me in Spanish, it was basically him saying, Hey, come over here. Do you need a ride? Hop in, I'll take ya. He kept saying that for five minutes like a robot, then just drove off. I let out a breath I didn't know I was holding in. I was trying to calm myself down and tell myself that that was it. But I knew it wouldn't be, and I was unfortunately right. His car showed back up not long later. The thing about my bus stop is that there's a bunch of houses right behind it. Before the houses is a good amount of space with only dirt. Cars can actually go in this area, and I've seen it before. For some reason, it shocked me to see him drive around the back and park right behind me. At this point, I was panicking, and tears were falling down my cheeks. 
I was already thinking I'd never see my family again, because this man was surely going to try and take me. I was frozen in place. I already knew that in crucial moments like this, my reaction is to freeze, not fight or flight. Freezing is what I do. I still believe it was the prayers I was saying that saved me. At the exact same time the man began to approach me, these two big bulky guys walked close by. They appeared to be walking their pit bull on a leash. I'm a sucker for dogs, but at this time I couldn't speak or say anything. I was still in my frozen state. I knew this was my only chance, and I fought to get those words out. They kept catching in my throat. It was my only chance to save myself, so I spoke out in a shaky voice. Excuse me, please, can you guys stay with me? That man over there won't leave me alone. I'm very scared. My words were choked up and I was shaking at this point. The guys were very kind-hearted, thankfully, and agreed to stay by my side. To come off as more intimidating, they even crossed their arms across their chest and flexed their muscles. They stared down the man, who at this point got back into his car and began reversing. He drove off and the guys stayed with me until my bus arrived. The time when this all ended was 9.59. I know some of you might be asking, why didn't you just go back to your high school? Well, at this point in night, no one would really be there. Mostly everyone else had already gone home. I did have a cell phone, but no one was going to be able to pick me up. The bus was my only transportation at that time, and I didn't know that Lyft or Uber existed. Actually, I'm not even sure it was a thing back then. Overall, I'm just happy to have been saved that day by the kind-hearted men. I hope one day I can see those guys that stayed with me and thank them for what they did. Because of them, I'm still here and able to share this story of mine. I'm still shaken up at the memory because of the scare it gave me. After that incident, I asked for a ride for the remainder of that season. Sometimes, even when you don't want to bug people with things, it doesn't really hurt to ask. It's better to be slightly annoying than to find yourself in a bad situation. You can always apologize to your friends, but you can't come back if something bad happens to you. This happened a few months ago in the beginning of summer. I've held off on sharing it for so long because I didn't want to be judged for my actions. I joined a stupid online dating app. I divorced just last winter. I was kind of living it up, you know. I somehow matched with this man who lived in New York, an eight-hour drive away from me. After texting for a few weeks, he sprung it on me that he was going to drive down to see me. Since I'd been staying with my family ever since the divorce, I decided we'd get a hotel. He told me to find one and he'd pay for it. I already felt super bad that he was driving so far, so I was trying to find good deals and the cheapest place that wasn't sketchy as fuck. I live about 40 minutes outside of the city in the state that I live in, and I'm not super familiar with some areas. The hotel I booked ended up being no bueno, but I didn't know this until I got there. It was dark by the time I arrived after getting lost four times. There was a very shady motel across the street, with two men smoking cigarettes on the porch. Lots of trucks and truckers traveling through, too. I was walking into this hotel thinking, well shit, I fucked up. I just went with it anyway, though, because I didn't really have a choice. And why, what we'll refer to the man as, was about an hour away, so he'd be there pretty soon. The hotel was run by Jamaicans, I think a whole family. This comes into play later, which is why I mention it. The woman who checked me in was fairly nice, but the whole place just gave off some weird vibes. The lighting, the heavy smell of bleach, the strange carpet, I don't know. It was really bright but also really dark, if that makes any sense. I started shaking as I was trying to check in. The reservation was under NY's name. At first, she told me she couldn't find it, 
His last name was Spanish, so I thought maybe I was pronouncing it wrong, even though I'm pretty good with my Spanish. This made it awkward, because now she knew I was meeting a stranger. I thought maybe he gave you the wrong name, she had said. I nervously chuckled. She put me on the second floor. I was expecting an elevator, but as I turned, I saw that behind me was a huge carpeted staircase. I get to my room and just pace around, waiting for this stranger from the internet to show up. It started raining. I was sitting by the window sipping a glass of wine when I see a pickup truck pull up. I think maybe it's him. A man in a black hoodie gets out and locks his truck, about 50 beep beeps or so, then runs inside. I started panicking, thinking it was him. He had no bags or luggage. Maybe he was just coming to kidnap me or something. There was a loud knock at the door. I jumped hard and immediately stood up. I made my way over to the door and looked through the peephole. It was NY. No black hoodie, carrying all his bags with him. I cracked the door and smiled. He came in and I shared my terrifying thoughts with him. We chuckled and had a laugh together. Sex happens, of course. Later that night, we were falling asleep. He was spooning me, but also had his arms all the way around me, with his head on top of my head. I was awoken from a dead sleep, sweaty because he was holding me so tightly. I thought that was what had woken me up, but then I heard it. Someone was fucking with our door. I heard the handle moving, as whoever it was tried to open it, but it refused to budge. NY jumped out of bed so fast, I wondered how long he'd been awake, listening to this to react so quickly. I pulled the covers up to my chin, as he was standing in the dark in his undies looking at the door. He looked through the peephole, and said he thought it was one of those Jamaican men who worked there. We had a chain on the door, as well as the locks, so he kept the chain on and opened it a few inches. Before he could even ask what the man wanted, the guy just called out, is the white girl in there? I remember getting chills all over my body. NY said no and slammed the door in his face, almost completely unbothered by this. The man said something about needing a credit card from me. NY yelled back that the room was on his card under his name, and he'd take care of it in the morning. I looked over at the clock and it was 2 a.m. I turned over and stared at the wall, hoping to fall back asleep. And why wrapped his arms around me again and immediately started snoring in my ear. Good thing he was hot. The next morning, we decided to get some breakfast. It was super early, and we were both feeling groggy from last night. I'm hoping that as we round the corner to the stairs that no one is at the front desk. They definitely heard the noises from our room, and I was feeling really embarrassed. And that was when I saw him. An older black male, standing a few feet from the exit. Honestly, I don't know if he was Jamaican or if he was part of the family who owned this place, or a guest or just someone else. I don't know. His face was sunken in, and he had a weird chilling look in his eyes. He was staring right at me. I knew, without even seeing him last night, that this must have been the same guy. And why whispered for me to just keep walking, so I broke eye contact with him, and leaned into NY as we made our way towards the exit. As we passed by, the man was silent. Then, as I'm pushing the door open to exit the building, he suddenly calls out, There's the white girl. I found the white girl. She makes a lot of noise. NY snorted, but I was terrified. I left for work after breakfast. I was gone a few hours and returned to the hotel to find the room empty. I texted NY and asked where he was. He texted back saying he was in the laundry room and he'd be right back up. I sat down on the bed waiting for him. I heard some footsteps outside the door, the floor creaking, like someone was standing out front shifting their weight back and forth. I figured maybe NY forgot his room key, so I got up to look through the peephole, only to see it was not him. The creepy man from before was standing outside the door, just staring in through the peephole. I jumped back and started crying. I called NY and yelled for him to come to the room quickly because the man was outside the door again. He was gone by the time NY arrived. He went down to the front desk and spoke to the woman about this man. She just kept saying she had no idea who he was talking about and that she would keep an eye out for him. 
That night, obviously, I had a hard time sleeping. I felt like I could feel him lingering around outside the door, but I was too scared to go and look to check, and Y was, of course, sleeping soundly. He was still a stranger, but he was the most comforting thing I had. We checked out the next morning. I grabbed his hand as we made our way down the stairs, because guess who was standing right there? Yeah, the woman from the front desk was now gone, replaced by a younger male. The creepy man was smiling as we neared the bottom of the stairs, his awful, bone-chilling grin. Lucky man with a white girl was the last comment we heard from this creep. NY spun around and told him to fuck off, then walked me out to my car. He waited while I drove off to make sure no one followed me. I don't know, maybe there's more we could have done. But again, the guy didn't actually do anything technically. It was just a very unnerving experience. About a month later, I was telling my dad about it. He laughed and told me I had picked the worst part of the city. He thought he'd heard about this place being shut down multiple times for either drugs or sex trafficking. 